Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, we are going to talk about the Jungian archetypes again. So if you haven't seen previous videos, it might be worth checking those out um, because, well, this video might not make that much sense with some of the concepts, but we'll see because I'm going to try and make the descriptions as easy to understand as possible. Now, the problem with my thinking and my descriptions of things is, well, Einstein had this quote, and I know that Einstein gets misquoted a lot, so I'm going to say that it was Einstein that said this, but you never know. But he basically said that if you know something, if you really understand something, you can describe it in very, very simple terms, and you don't have to be so... Um, complex in the way you describe it, right? Uh, maybe it's a testament to certain neurotic tendencies that I still have. Maybe it's a testament to um, the fact that I don't know certain things as deeply as maybe I could do. I don't know. Maybe it's a mix of those things that, that is the reason that I generally uh, speak and it's quite complex. Certainly in cer certain circumstances, it feels as if it, it would be incredibly hard to try and make things simpler. And the reason for that is simply because of the language that we have. Unfortunately, we've had to complexify language to include a certain range of phenomena. And in that complexification, we exclude certain people who haven't been, let's say, indoctrinated into certain intellectual ideas. And so because of that, we get this disconnect. And this could get onto the whole disconnect between, let's say, intellectuals and non-intellectuals, or what we could categorize as non-intellectuals and intellectuals. Um, but we won't get into that. But I'm going to try and make it as kind of well-rounded, simple um, as possible. Now, I am a very, very empirical psychologist and a very, very empirical philosopher. What that means is I try to stay as close to reality as possible. Now, it's a very tricky word, reality, and we have all of these subjective perceptions on reality so we can never really say well you're staying quite close to reality you can never really say that but from my viewpoint my let's say I've got some glasses on you know those um, really really cool glasses that you get when you go into a party and they've got those little uh, they're like silver and they've got those little um, you know, straight rods on them or whatever. And you can only see little bits through the little rods, right? So they're like that, you know, and it's pretty cool. Um, that's our life. And those glasses are stuck to our face permanently. And uh, the way in which I perceive life is the way in which my anatomy and also as uh, moving further from that, my physiology as well, um, certainly my neurophysiology, is adapted. Everyone's brain is unique. Everyone's brain is different. And we can observe, quite obviously, in scientific psych psychology, in 21st century psychology, that there are differentiations with trait structure. There are differentiations with the way in which we function in our brain that mean we have a certain schema on life. And what I mean by when I say schema is a certain structure and a way of viewing life. And we are confined in that. And partially that's due to socialization, of course, and partially that's due to genetics. Um, and so because of that, I will always view reality through those little glasses which slightly distort it in the way that I'm differentiated. Namely, for me, 
I will see links between things and I will always seem to colour life with a certain aesthetic and imagination um, and I'll always be quite curious and that's because of the trait openness that's differentiated itself in my genetics and obviously therefore in the way I perceive the world and in my consciousness whereas someone else differentiated the conscientiousness will be more orderly, will be uh, possibly more industrious as well, and certain things like that. Um, and so they have those glasses firmly fixed to their face, and that's the way they work, and their schema, their structure on reality, the way they see and perceive the world, will be different to mine. But on the base of it, I like to try and stay as close to whatever reality that I can perceive is. And uh, that's how I work as a philosopher. Um, so I wanted to talk about the archetypes and I wanted to, to link these archetypes to instincts. This seems to me the work that needs to be done furthering Jungian psychology. Whether we're doing this in more of a philosophical, empirical setting like I'm going to do in this video, or whether we're going to actually do this in more of a scientific setting and also um, do it in a way that we can set it up in um, what's known uh, in psychology as event-related potentials or um, basically a study in which you will observe uh, certain things in the brain, certain reactions in the brain, uh, with paired with obviously an external stimulus, and then we could see some sort of uh, reaction there that would then give us more grounding with regards to the relationship between psych psychological images that we term the archetypes and um, emotional reactions that have a link causally to a instinctual. Uh, basis. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think of the way you could actually do that in, in terms of a scientific study. You could possibly operationalize. Operationalize basically means where you form a certain definition of a particular thing so that then you can understand what you are wanting to observe in a, in a study. You could operationalize the definition of an archetype uh, and you could present someone when, when they've got obviously uh, some sort of thing on the brain, like one of those nets and stuff like that. When what you could do is you could introduce a phenomena or an experience that would link to a certain archetype or an archetypal response. And since you've operationalized that def definition of an archetype or an archetypal response, and you can observe the reaction in the brain while it's happening, literally in milliseconds, then what you can do is you can pair that experience and you can say, that emotional reaction is tied to an instinctual response that is also tied to an archetypal situation. The way in which you would probably have to do it is provide an external stimulus that is relating to a known archetypal image in the psyche. So you would pair um, maybe a, a mother and a child or something like that, and then you could see, you could observe in that experience because that mother is represent representing a certain archetypal pattern in a behavior or a certain archetypal image, you could try and pair it based on the event relate related potential, showing the emotion and potentially being able to infer that, that instinctual response. And then you could say, well, there's clearly something there, there's a phenomenon there. But how you would actually determine, let's say, in the child or in the mother or, or possibly in both, the actual archetypal image that arises, you would only, the only way you'd be able to do that is by ask, asking the two participants what they were able to see. And if the archetypal image was unconscious, they wouldn't be able to see the archetypal image in their psyche. So it gets a bit, you know, like that. But you could certainly observe scientifically 
you know, like in hard science, um, a certain pattern in a behavior that would arise and that could be seen in the brain as an emotional reaction um, and seen subjectively as the actual uh, pattern in a behavior. And that could be specified as an archetype. And then you could say, well, there you go. Archetypes exist in that, that way. But to do it in a more philosophically empirical way and just a, a, a more logical way, let's say, rather than doing it in a scientific experiment, uh, which I do believe is is necessary going forward, um, I'm going to get up something that I wrote um, down the other day. So every pre-reality mental fantasy of a conversation you may have in the future with someone is a product of your own psychic state. It shows your fears, disintegration with a certain potential experience, and parts of your personality that need attending to. If you fantasize about a conversation in which you are being rebellious, and then state to yourself in laughter, could you imagine if I said that? It's obvious that you are not fully integrated with your instincts for rivalry slash dominance, and instead have an over-reinforcement for instincts pertaining to shyness. The fantasies show the instincts in very, very subtle ways. So let me just paint a picture of that for you. So you've got a meeting coming up and there's someone in the meeting who you know and uh, she's called Barbara. We're just going to go with Barbara. So it's a great name, isn't it? Barbara. Just one of those random names that you just use for an example. It's just it's just gold. Anyway, so you got Barbara and you don't like the way she does her hair, right? So she's there, uh, you know, you're thinking in your mind, you, you, you're actually fantasizing in your mind about before the interview about having this conversation and, you've, and you're loving it because you're having a bit of a play about with your, your fantasy and you're thinking, uh, you, you, you know, and you... you you take it in your mind to a certain degree that you wouldn't take it to in reality. So you'd be like, um, think, you, you, you imagine that you, you're having a joke with her about a hair or maybe doing something like uh, having a bit of an argument with her about a hair and stuff like that. And, it, and of course, what you're doing right in that moment is you're exercising your instincts for play. The, the very fantasy itself is within an instinctual reaction because it's something that, that randomly takes you over slowly. You know, when we, we're just maybe doing what we're doing, but then suddenly we'll have this fantasy in our mind about just, just this funny situation that could happen. And then we get drawn into it and we think, oh God, yeah, could you imagine, bloody hell, you think in your mind, you've got this image up here. And then you think, oh God, could you imagine if I said that and all the rest of it? And so right there and then you're in the instinct for play as it is. But what's happening is you're coming out of that and you think to yourself, or you might think to yourself, oh God, could you imagine if, you know, if I actually said that, if that, that, if I did that, bloody hell, I couldn't, couldn't, I can't say that all the rest of it. And so right there, what that is indicating in that moment is that your psyche is producing a fantasy to allow you to see an element of your, your personality, an instinctual element or an instinctual expression of your personality that actually isn't fully integrated because instead of it coming through just as a part of your conscious personality it's coming through in a fantasy that then you hide away and that you would never show in reality uh, or you might not show in reality let's say so you've got this kind of fantasy that comes along and you you're thinking about this uh, situation and you're like, no, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm never going to say that, da, da, da. And so you have a, a disintegration with your, with those, with a very, very fine and subtle, um, uh, part of that instinct for, for rivalry or that instinct for dominance that, that is, that is present. And, uh, it's in this way that the, the instincts work within us and, they flow as well and they bleed into one another and they they have certain happenings within us. And Barbara herself is made up of all these instinctual reactions that she's having and that she's had and that define her 
certain personality and her certain temperament and that has led also to her getting her hair cut in a certain way that has then led you to have certain prejudices against her. And so what happens is that the instincts within you are working in a prejudice, prejudicial way against her, whereas her instincts have led her to that same point in which made you have those specific fantasies over her. And not only that, the psyche uses your landscape to press up these fantasies of the things that you're not quite integrated with. Now, the archetypes, they're all... Every situation is in life is archetypal. There isn't a situation in life that isn't archetypal. So all of those things, all of those instincts working within Barbara, she's a personalised individual based on those instincts and based on those little compulsions that she's had throughout the day and that have, that have worked inside of her and that have, that have taken her over slightly and that obviously even in consciousness she's every single word that she's using is archetypal in a very, very subtle way. I say to you on a video, and I've touched upon this before, I believe, whether it's on video before or whether it's in piece of writing. I know I've definitely done it in piece of writing. I don't know whether I've touched it on, on it on video. But when I say, oh, I wonder why that is, you see, that's a very, very subtle working of my instincts for curiosity. When I have a joke with myself, that's a very, very subtle working. Even though I'm completely conscious, I'm not being taken over by an archetype to the degree that we get taken over by an archetype um, when, for example, we have an anima projection or animus projection on someone. I'm not getting taken over in terms of, um, oh, I feel head over heels for this particular person, which would then be an, uh, a, a real instinctual reaction based on, of course, attraction for either a member of the opposite sex or, of course, uh, someone with the same sex as well. Um, but it's not like that, but it's a subtle archetypal reaction that works within your consciousness. That's how the archetypes work. That's the fine gradient of, of how they work. It's the same with... Um, things like the persona as well, or, or things like the anima, in which it works in very, 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 very subtle ways within your behavior, the archetype. It, let's say I'm in the kitchen, and let's say I have a projection on someone, and let's say I'm projecting a certain instinct on them, which is also a certain archetype as well. It has a link to an archetype, an archetypal form. And let's say that the certain projection I have put on them lends itself that I would take the opposite position, instinctual position. So let's say I project my animus out onto someone, then I then become the anima in that situation. I then adopt the, the, the patterning of behavior that goes, so goes along with the anima and also from that, I also get elements of uh, persona fears as well. So I might, uh, what you will observe in behavior is you won't do things in the way that you would do them if that person wasn't there because you've got an instinctual, you're pro you are literally projecting part of your instincts that you have a disintegration with in your personality onto that other person, and so then the opposite instinct has to come, come in. Imagine if you're walking down the street and you see a big burly guy, right? And, and this is especially true. Of course, it's a little bit stereotypical, but it's especially true in certain women. Imagine you've got a big burly guy walking down the street and you're a woman. And that big burly guy comes in and you, and you, you feel just subtly, especially a young woman as well, 
feel a little bit subtly a bit, oh, I don't, you know, who's this guy kind of thing, oh, you know, he looks a bit scary, looks a bit, you know, and you feel a little bit like that. So, um, what you're doing is you're projecting your instinct for fight, essentially, or dominance, or anything like that, you're projecting that unconsciously at that individual who's walking down the street, and they match that because of their physical appearance, because they're obviously a big burly guy, and you could imagine that they would have the capability to, you know, beat you up or whatever, so naturally you project that unconsciously onto that individual. So then obviously you take the opposite side, you, you take the flight, and so you, you, you look down, or you look away, or you feel anxious, and, and that, that's that, because you've projected out the thing that was actually inside yourself, but it was a part, or it had the potential to be a part of your personality, but in that moment you projected it out, and so you have to take the opposite. So when I'm walking down the street, I can see all of these archetypal or instinctual reactions between people, and you can do it so that then... Um, in your facial, because like, this is just my own psychological experiments, really. I've done it so that then in my uh, physiognomy or my, my kind of facial expressions and the changes within my facial expressions, I've done it and I've looked at people for a little bit of a little short length of time to see what they do. And you can see the archetypes working in people in very, very subtle ways. You imagine you're walking up the street, I've got my big overcoat on, got my hat on, and I give a bit of a kind of a look, you know, like just very subtle, and I look at someone, and then they turn away like that, or they do that, because they see in me, or they're projecting at me, those those fight instincts, and then they think, then they automatically take the other. Now, of course, it doesn't always work like that, because often when you get two men, that, you know, let's say in the traditional idea of those two men being two animuses, then, you know, it might work subtly differently. But if you, certainly if you've got a man and a woman, you can see the persona immediately in the woman, which is in compensatory the relationship to the anima, and they look down. There's that, there's that insecurity, that fear, that whatever, you know? Um, and so you can see these things working in very, very, very subtle ways. And it's in conversation. And it's in the little nuances of conversation. It's in cracking a joke. Like I said previously, you crack a joke. That's an instinctual reaction. That's not, it's not an instinctual reaction in the way that we've been taught to think about instinctual reactions. We've been taught to think about instinctual reactions as when someone's feeling very sexual and they, they have a lot of sexual energy and it's like a, an enrapturement. Yes, of course, that's an instinctual reaction. But what I would say is that's an instinctual reaction on a very, very high level. There's a whole gradiented system of, of instinctual reactions that we are portraying at every single moment in our life. We are nothing but an arrangement of instincts. And my particular brain and my particular body and my particular the way in which I am differentiated genetically, of course, I have a certain individualized structure that lends itself to portraying certain instincts more and more of the time. And so therefore, I I portray those instincts more and, and, and you get into a kind of reinforcement as well with that. Uh, and as I've said before, for me, it's the instinct for curiosity and that in humans is... Um, has developed itself or has evolved within the prefrontal cortex. And so instead of curiosity, we get intellectual curiosity. And intellectual curiosity is one of the subfacets of trait openness, which is one of the genetic or has a uh, partly a genetic component uh, within the big five trait model, which is the superior model used in personality trait psychology at the moment which is very interesting, isn't it? And we see that that's an instinct, that actually trait openness has an instinctual component to it. There is an instinct within the idea of trait openness. Um, and that's intellectual curiosity. And that intellectual curiosity in archetypal terms 
is the archetype of the sage, which is the whole, you know, you know the the idea of the thinker. I don't know what what does the thinker statue look like? Is it like that or is it like that? I don't know. I think it's like that. Isn't it? Anyway, but um, there's certain actually modes of of gesture as well that actually are archetypal. Uh, and anatomically or physio well not really physiologically I suppose but more partly physiologically um but there's there's types of actual sort of poses and stuff that are archetype that are instinctual whenever I'm um and I do this unconsciously whenever I'm thinking about things like in that instinct of intellectual curiosity I do I do this and now that is a very, uh, and, mm, you know, and that, that isn't something you, I mean, you could make a small argument for it being socialized, but that's something that's been around for thousands of years. That's something that we are aware of. When I do this, hmm, you know immediately what that is. You know immediately I'm thinking. You know, immediately I'm pondering on something really, really hard. And that's a, a complex pattern of behavior from an instinct. And in humans, it's differentiated itself to, to a high intellectual level so that then the archetypes can come out in certain more creative and more elaborate ways. For example, the sage, so the, uh, in which a certain clothing is now become associated with it and yeah okay that's let's say we should say that's slightly more socialized and things like that um but there's certain things associated with it and it's certain things that have that have flowered from this uh intellectual differentiation of these certain instincts that now have created this archetypal structure that's very very complex and so there's all these different ways, you know, that these can come out. I mean, you could say that, um, I mean, obviously the instinct for parental love, things like that. And you can see this in, it's not just when a mother runs over to a child and grabs them with both her arms and you can clearly see that's an instinctual reaction because obviously we've got a lot of parental love there. But it's very, very, very subtle. Child says to mum, Oh, you know, I, could I have my little snack or whatever? And and the child, of, of course, is a little bit like uh, acting again within the instinct in terms of um, more of a um, a childlike instinct. Let's say I've got, I've actually got the instincts on my phone, uh, so we'll see if we can't actually put that down to to one of them. See, so you would say maybe there's a there's an element of, of shyness to that. Um, but it's not quite that. But the child responds to the parent in a certain way. And the parental instinct, let's say, the parental love, the child can feel that and can also instinctually play to that as well. So the child says, oh, could I have this little snack or whatever? And then the mother you know, obviously she's not really taken over by an instinct to a really high grade degree, but she is very, very subtly. And she thinks, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll get you that, I'll get you that. And she goes, and that, what's happening in the brain or what's happening in her mind is this, oh, yeah, I must go and get that for, for the child because he wants it. And I uh, make sure, I want to make sure that he's okay and da 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 So there's that working in there, you see. And of course... Um, you, you can see quite easily how that gets into a relationship with the child and the mother where uh, the mother is basically overprotective and, you know, she plays... The child starts to unconsciously play to her instincts and then she continues to play to the child and wants them to be happy and all the rest of it and their love is the only thing or their happiness, the child's happiness is the only thing that she craves and if she doesn't get that she feels um you know empty she feels um as if she's not lived by her, her natural tendency to care for that child but of course that's a negative 
thing because it goes round and goes round and then that child grows up and, uh, well, God, I'm not going to go into the many different variants of how that child can, can then be in terms of life, in terms of, uh, possibly having a neurosis or, uh, possibly just certainly, you know, certain mild neurotic tendencies there with that child. But you see, it works in very, 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 very subtle ways and you've, you've got to catch it. You've got to, you know, you've got to understand it. It's very, very, very hard to understand these subtle ways that, that this works in. Um, and of course, you can see it between man and woman. I've talked about it before in, in, in terms of, let's say you've got a man and his wife and you can see this kind of um, interplay when... There's, there's these moods there or whatever it may be. You can see a certain interplay between um, man and wife and how the woman affects a man and how the uh, man affects a woman and things like that. Um, and of course, obviously, you've got the bigger instinctual reactions as well. Like um, if we're going to really get into, you know, the instincts in terms of aggression or you know, anger and, and also dominance and fight and things like that. Um, you can see those quite clearly in people actually having fights, people actually being violent. That is, of course, an instinctual reaction, but it's one that's more pronounced. It's one that's uh, bigger. It's one that's more um, out there. Now, you also kind of see this, uh, again, very, very subtle ways. If, if I say... Oh, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be good to play a game today? Not play a board game today, and you get this kind of just little desire, this little feeling, and you, you know you've got that idea, and you just get this lovely little desire, and it comes in your mind. And you think, yeah, wouldn't it be nice to play a board game later? And you get this little fantasy in your mind. Oh, I'm uh, I'm looking at the board. There's Monopoly and playing it, and that again, that's the that's the instincts for play. That's that's actually working within you on a very, very subtle level that takes you over. That Well, not that it takes you over, but that basically gives you the idea and then the idea then goes to create the actual situation in life. Um, whereas if you didn't have that idea or that instinct, then you, that situation wouldn't arise. Um, so again, that's how that works. And then you start to go through, and I've not done this in completion yet. That's why this video is a little bit jittery because I'm not, I'm not able to do this in completion. But if you can unpack all of the experiences of life, all of these thoughts and ideas that you have, and then you actually understand them in instinctual terms, you will actually see in a way how your entire life is guided by these very, very, very subtle reactions of the instincts. And you start to think, bloody hell, what is actually me? Because Right now, I'm not me. I'm an in, I'm an instinctual. I'm a certain arrangement right at this moment of instinctual phenomenon, or phenomena, I should say. Of course, right now, exercising for the most part, for the main part, the instinct that I'm exercising right now is intellectual curiosity. Oh, I wonder why this is. Oh, I wonder what this is. But also, I can I can perceive in myself that there's definitely a little bit of that that play in me, that little bit of uh, also that goes along with the the Joker archetype and things like that that that's subtly working in there because it's interesting, but it's interesting in a fun way. So then you've got those instincts kind of crossing as well. Um, so of course things bleed into one another and things happen in such a way, but. Um, we, we really get quite dumbfounded by all these things that go on and that actually create our life and create our, our understanding of, and, and, and literally create the things that we do and go off and do this and do that and do the other. Well, of course, naturally, you can... Um, any idea for going, oh, oh let's... Um, oh, you know, guys... I really fancy going Tesco later. Do you want to come and go, you know, do you want to go to Tesco? Sociability, the instinct for, for being social. Not only that, but it's matched very, very subtly with a slight little bit of the um, instincts for, for exploration, which is also, it, it, it crosses over into the curiosity instincts as well. Because you maybe you don't go Tesco that often and you have this idea, this curious desire 
to go to. Oh, I've, I've not been Tesco in a while. I wonder what's there. I wonder what's what's it, what, it, what it's looking like now. Oh, I'll go down. And of course, you make this fantasy in your mind. It might even be unconscious to you, the, the, the imagery. The imagery might be unconscious or, or semi-conscious, I should say. But the idea is there. Uh, no doubt the idea is there and the imagery is there, but it might be unconscious to you. But then you might create this image in your mind, maybe as I say, partially unconscious, of you and your friends down Tesco and you explore, you know, you see what's on the ends of the aisles and stuff like that. And so you wing up your friend, oh, you want to, you know, so it's, it's exactly that. The, the instincts in a very, very fine way. They're going to play with you. They're going to play with you. And you think, well, is this me or is this not me? Because we say, well, really it is me because I'm having that, you know, it is essentially my brain that produces that idea. Now, of course, your brain producing that idea is a the sum of, of the environment that you're in. Everything in the past within your environment has come together to make it so that you will have that spontaneous idea within that moment. So maybe the case is that you went to te you well, no, maybe you didn't go to Tesco, because I've just said that in this example, you probably haven't gone to Tesco for quite a while. But maybe a few days ago, you went to Sainsbury's with the guys or whatever. And maybe you've done some other things a few days ago. And so those things have worked in a certain arrangement to then end up giving you that spontaneous idea at that particular moment and then you ring up the guys and do it again and not only that because that's a very very basic way of looking at it every single thing and this is where you get into very very complex causality every single thing and every single person you've met and every single experience you've had and every dream that you've had prior to that as well because dreams go to affect behavior the next day unconsciously every single thing that you have interacted with on an unconscious level or a conscious level has gone to affect that exact moment with that exact idea popping up at that, that exact time and of course all of those other things in the previous days all of those different things are formulated uh, within instincts, within certain micro instinctual reactions that you're perceiving in others, that you have yourself, that you are interacting with the environment within as well. And so therefore, behind that idea, there's that kind of instinct there as well, that's also been a product of all these other things that have gone in, in your past. And so then, oh, there we go. There, uh, let, let's go. You know, and that's that. And, it, and it, it's genius. You know, and and that's how life works. And that's how we play out. And that's why we do these things. Um, uh, and um, so, you know, in a, in a part, it's you. In a way, it's you because, well, you're you. You're in this body. You have the the brain to produce these ideas and all the rest of it. And so. You know, it's partially you, but there's not really any ego control there, actually. It's partly instincts, it's partly external environment, maybe a few other things thrown in. But really, you don't have any any particular ego control over it. Um, you know, I, I don't know when someone asks me to go to the supermarket with them, because we go to the supermarket a lot in our flat. I don't know why I do that instead of just maybe sitting on my bed or doing some work or whatever. I just, I just do it. I just do it. I mean, I can say, I can speculate, I can say, well, sometimes when they ask me, I feel, I, I think, I, I feel this kind of nice warm feeling inside me. I think, oh, they want me to go to Tesco. That's nice. And then I think, um, yeah, go on. I'll, I'll go to Tesco. You know, probably I maybe should do this work, but go on, I'll go to Tesco. And I mean, that's a very, very complex working of, of instincts because you've got the, the lover, in the lover archetype, which is, of course is relating to a variety of forms of, of, of love. Not, of, of course, some people put it straight to sexual love it's not sexual love it's it's all sorts of forms of love and sociability can come into that archetype as well obviously the instinct of sociability comes into that and so you've got those working so you've got 
well, who, you know, you maybe you don't know who's going. So then you've got a complex mix of you're thinking, oh, I wonder who's going to go. And, and you've got, you, so you've got that instinct working in you. Then you've got the instinct within that instinct also, almost, or within that idea of, I wonder who's going to go. Then you've got the instinct for sociability, which is within that idea of, I suppose, who's going to go, as what, the curiosity and the sociability. And then you've got um, also the kind of exploratory instinct, which is like, oh, yeah, you know, it'd be good to go down the supermarket, see what's there and all the rest of it. So you've got that, those three all working together. And then you think, okay, I'll go. And and, and, and so you've made a decision and you think it's rational, but it's based on those three things working inside you. And of course, that is a um, in unison with the environment or with the experience that has been set up for you or around you. Um, if those people weren't going to Tesco, if that person didn't knock on the door, obviously those kind of things wouldn't necessarily arise. Uh, and I suppose this is a, a kind of... Um, a behaviourist look on the arch not on the archetypes, but on the instincts, to say that while in certain situations, of course, it takes the ex well, actually, you could argue in all situations, it takes the external uh, the external stimulus to arise the instinct within you, uh, and then that's how it that's how it happens. It's like with uh, if you've got a projection on someone, when we say, you know, an anima projection, which I don't know whether I explained before, but an anima projection, basically, you project out the feminine side of your own unconscious, uh, again, which is a very, very fine, autonomous, um, complex web of behavior that is associated to certain traits of the feminine that then gets projected onto the feminine and then you go head over heels and it's a crush. It's a crush, basically. And I've talked about it before, but just in case someone hasn't, you know, didn't know about it, basically. So, um, but that takes the external stimulus of a woman for me to be able to do that or for a woman to project onto a man or for a man to project onto a man or for a woman to project onto a woman. Because it can happen in all different ways, as we're very well aware, with um, the the great diversity that we've got in terms of sexuality and in terms of gender. It's not certainly just one way. There's many different ways this can happen. So, um, you know, of course, that that's kind of played into it, essentially. Um, but that's that's the instincts. That's the archetypes. That's the way they 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 enwrap to you that's the way they get you and it's always through ideas we can't really have an instinct fully without first an idea or possibly synonymously at, you know at the exact same time as an idea or or rather an idea slash fantasy when an instinct comes up let's say for sexual love whether you're conscious or unconscious of it, there is a an idea or a fantasy in your mind at the same time as that. I mean, sometimes beforehand, prior, there's the idea there. And that that's what you could say, well, the instinct is building up. Because physiologically, your desire for sex builds up. It's not something that... Well, sometimes it might be something that comes on you more fiercely, and that might be because of the presence of an external stimuli. But, or stimulus. But sometimes what will happen is it'll build up. And so it's like hunger. And what, what happens with hunger is you eat and then you've got an allotted amount of time that slowly, very, very finally, that is unconscious to you for, for the most part until you really start to get hungry. You're slowly getting more and more hungry. And it's a gradiented system like that, you see. And you get... And then you're unconscious of it when you're full, you're all satisfied, you're full, you're lovely. But then so, something slowly starts to come in and you think, oh, I'm just very, very subtly hungry. And then you think, ah, oh, don't worry, I'll get on with my work. Da, da. And then it builds up and builds up and then you have to have food, right? And that's how it is. And and so you could see it's the same like that with, let's say, the sexual instinct to a degree. You 
maybe have this idea and then, it, it, you know, you know the idea or whatever. And it builds up and it builds up and it builds up and, and then obviously it ends up wanting to express itself more prominently. And, and so that gradiented system is in line with physiological reactions. For example, like eating or like going to the toilet. It's the same with going to the toilet. You, it's a gradiented thing. You have a drink, like, no, well, you go to the toilet and then you have a drink or whatever and it slowly builds up over time until you have to go to the toilet. That's how it is. And it's all these kind of, it's this gradiented system. And this is also why or how the archetypes can work in subtle ways. It's not the archetype, sorry, not uh, just archetypes, but instincts really, but instincts and, and archetypes to me are synonymous. They're not, the two, they're the same phenomena. Um, so this is how they can work, is that this is how they can work in a, in a finite way and not just in this way that we've been told how they can work in terms of this real big way of this outburst of instinctual energy. That's, that's just what you see consciously. That's like the, the, the maximum level of your hunger, Th that instinctual reaction. When you're really, let's say, when you're really aggressive with someone, that's the conscious part of it. But, and that's the real, you know, instinctual, raw conscious part of it. Just like as if you're really hungry or just as if you really needed the toilet. You have to do it. But other ways it comes through, it's so fine. It's so just pops up here and there and here and there and here and there and, and that sort of way. Not that there's this big outburst. Only only at times there's this big outburst. And of course, the instincts can work in a certain way in which they uh, build up. But for the most part, we have to be unconscious of this. For example, often uh, there's been days in my life where I've been quite, I felt quite, um, jokey, you know, but it's built up over the day and morning or late or afternoon, maybe I've not really felt that jokey or anything like that, but there's maybe little things in my behavior that are subtly leaning towards that particular uh, way of behavior. But then over, you know, come the afternoon, I'm a bit more jokey. I'm a bit more like, you know, um, alive in such a way. And what that is, at least what I would hypothesize, because we are actually getting into kind of slightly more new ground now, or maybe not new ground, but it's very, very deep Jungian stuff that we're getting into now. I mean, Jung will have had these ideas, will have seen these things, but this is deep Jungian stuff. This isn't like, you know, entry level stuff. This is like the more, um, when you've learned about the archetypes to a certain degree, then you can start to really start thinking in this way, you know, about them experientially. Um, but yeah, the, it, this builds up and it builds up like this and then it has these bursts out, you see, and then it goes away. And then some other thing comes in, you know, and it's at the moment, it's when we're more, let's say, or when we can be more attentive to ourselves and we can be more, well, as centered as we can be, that then we're more ourselves. We're like, as we are as an individual personality, that yes, of course, is producing minor subtle instinctual responses, but that isn't necessarily getting to the major blowouts of instinctual responses and things like that. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't do that because that's very natural to have those spontaneous instinctual uh, impulses. It's very natural to eat food. We shouldn't stop eating food. So why should we stop having those powerful instinctual responses? But of course, when we're integrated, and I'm certainly not saying I'm integrated with the bloody instincts. I tell you, I'm bloody not. But when we're integrated with the instincts, then these things come to more consciousness and, and they become softer. Because imagine if you're not integrated with a certain instinct. Now, I'm going to use a sexual instinct because, of course, that's something that's personal to me. 
So if you're not integrated with the, with the sexual instinct, that's going to come out in your behavior. In the fact, namely, that either you're going to totally avoid sex or you're going to not at all involve yourself in it, or you're going to be have an over-interest in it. You're going to be overly captivated by that instinctual side of life. And this is what we see in people with neuroses and things like that all the time. It's what happens. Uh, you know, it's no secret to the psychoanalyst that this is the case. But when that, when we can get that individual to having integration with that particular instinct, well, after a while, obviously, initially, let's say they've, they've not had sex for quite a while, they've got to get it out of the system a bit. You know, you've got to have those um, more instinctual reactions, those bursts more frequently. But then once they've got that initial thing out of the way, then it's like, well, it calms down a bit. It's a bit more integrated. You don't get those, you know, you don't get as much of that kind of like vroom, vroom, vroom or that real attachment to that thing or that real disattachment to that thing or, or that removal from that thing. It's actually more of a healthy level. Um, so this is why I say my, the way I look at psychology is philosophically empirical and about reality. You know, psychologists don't know a thing these days. And yeah, okay, um, you know, I, I might be speaking quite brashly there or whatever, but you can see in the way I've highlighted this video, how obvious this is, how obvious that this is the way the world works, how obvious that these things do happen and they occur all the time. Yet modern psychology disregards this completely. Now, if it actually regarded this, taking away, maybe taking away the idea of the anima and animus because of the fact now we have deeper understanding of gender, and sex and things like that. But I would argue that there's definitely merits to the animo and animus, whether we're talking in the biological view or the socialized view. But the instincts in such a way, if we can observe them and in so, you know, if we can observe them like I've logically laid out for you there and, and given you some kind of anecdotal, or well, not anecdotal, but just some scenarios which are clearly evident that's what's happening, um, then we should be pursuing this more than anything. This is, I would say, the great secret. Well, it might be okay, it might be bigging it up a bit too much there. I was going to say the great secret of psychology. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, of course, and this, that would be quite naive to say, oh yes, well, this solves everything in psychology. Of course, I would argue that people, let's say, with depression or with anxiety, uh, it's very likely that it's because of a, uh, an over-reinforcement of a certain instinct opposed to another instinct, namely, of course, in anxiety, um, the flight instinct or as some research has been done, as I've talked about, uh, within women, the tend and, dep uh, tend and befriend um, response. So it's kind of more observed that in men, it's kind of more of a fight response, sometimes a flight response. But in women, it's more of a tend and be befriend response um, rather than a flight response specifically. But whether we're talking men or women, it's generally, let's say, it's this reinforcement of this flight instinct. Of course, it's come over many, many years, over all sorts of uh, bad experiences and things like that that have constellated within their own conscious that have made them specifically to have a, a reinforcement of that instinct. But nonetheless, nonetheless, it's a reinforcement of that instinct, which generally that comes out in behavior in terms of not doing things or hiding themselves away, not necessarily being social, because, of course, if you've got a reinforcement of a flight instinct, you're not going to go out there and be social with everyone, are you? I mean, that's just ridiculous, because the flight instinct is also, it, can, or it could be correlated quite easily with introversion. And so if you're going to be like that, you're going to be closed away, you're not going to be exploring, or you, you're going to be... because exploring is the exact opposite of neuroticism, which is the trait which we're, we're generally talking about here. So you're not going to be doing any of that or anything like that. So it, it's going to typify its way in that way. And you're going to 
behave in certain ways that, that close off, close off, close off. So, so what do you do? Well, of course, in psychoanalysis the, or, or uh, exposure therapy or, or uh, if you're a behavior analyst or anything like that, you're going to use certain things, you know, exposure, uh, well, yeah, I just said exposure therapy, but, you know, you will use that as a component. Um, you know, you'll get try and get the individual out there. You'll also talk to them and you'll be sympathetic to how they're feeling. And maybe they can't do certain things in terms of exposure therapy for a while. So then you try and look into their past a little bit, see what's there, maybe get them a little bit more integrated with their past. And then you take them out there and you take them out there and you, you take them out there to the things that they're scared of. And, and you try and hold them to those things in a, you know, not too much of an aggressive or assertive way, but you try and, you know, get them into doing those things. And then that integrates the fight instinct a little bit more. And so the, the individual, in terms of a limbic system response, you know, the, the, they're not getting into that kind of, uh, well, is it the limbic system? Yeah, I suppose it might be, yeah. Um in terms of a response, they're not having a fight, uh, flight response anymore, but they're having a, uh, a more of a fight response. So they're not getting that anxiety. They're not getting all those release of different chemicals that are then obviously me meaning they're having physiological reactions, heart palpitations, all, all that sort of sw sweat. God no, you know the list is endless of anxiety symptoms. We all know that. Um, but they're not having that as much anymore. And then they think, oh, well, you know, oh, maybe I can go out and do that thing. And then we have these ideas that come, that are from instincts. And they think, oh, you know, I'd quite like to go there. And that's an instinct for curiosity again, like in that exploratory instinct. And because they've lowered the instinct for flight and they've replaced it a little bit in their experiences with that fight instinct, what they've done is they've completely re- conceptualized what is fearful to them and what isn't fearful to them. So now, maybe going on the train to, you know, for two hours to this place might have been very, very hard for them previously. But they've done this exposure therapy over maybe a number, it might be a year or it might be two years, it might be way less than that, it might be more than that, you know. God, you just don't know with different individuals, it varies. All sorts of timescales. But uh, they can they can do that now, they've, they've, uh, and they think, yeah, I, I can do that, and I want to go out, and I want to do that, and then that reinforces it more. You see, it's like it's it's basically a behavioural reinforcement of the instincts. We need uh, we need behavioural. Um, well, what I've termed it is archetypal behaviorism, which would be a new field based on. Uh, Jungian psychology of the, the instincts or the archetypes paired with behavioral reinforcement so that then you can reinforce the instincts that are missing in that individual that are clearly um, the opposite instincts to those that are giving them giving them trouble and then you you reinforce it that way and get them out into the world it's quite it's not hard at all from a um, practical standpoint of course individuals are complex and I should say, really, it's not hard at all from a theoretical standpoint. You could run into some sort of difficulties practically, but generally it seems that it would work quite well, actually. Um, so, you know, and, and so we need to be able to do this. This, this is what needs to happen. Um, but people don't see this, you know, people people are blind to it a lot of the time. And so because people are blind to it, they uh, can't, they can't get over it, you know. And traditional kind of exposure therapy works in exactly the same way without realizing it. Uh, in a way, archetypal behaviorism already is working, shall we say, within uh, behavior uh, analysis or, or within a behavior analyst or within psychoanalysis as well. It's already in there working, but it's just, it's not been conceptualized in that particular way. And I think that if we could conceptualize it in that way, maybe it would be a bit superfluous, but 
what it would at least give us the ability to do is conceptualize it in a way of directly on the instincts. And then because we're conceptualizing it and directing our attention directly to the instincts, we then can start to understand where these reactions are actually coming from and why this person is actually um, afraid in this particular way. You know, we can a behavior analyst can say, oh, well, of course, this person's afraid of, of this thing and that's why they're not doing it. And of course, that is the case. And so they are acting out an idea of archetypal behavior isn't within that. But if that analyst were to say, ah, well, this individual, I can see within them this particular uh, instinctual um, deficiency that they actually need to overcome this, and maybe this will then open up these particular instincts that, that they were previously kind of suppressing because you just can't use them, then what we can do after the initial stage is done is we can see if there's any sort of natural desire coming from the individual for, for these particular instincts, sociability, exploration, these kind of things, and then we can direct our therapy once the initial kind of fight flight response is dull down a bit, we can start to direct our therapy in that way because, yeah, okay, it's one thing that an individual has, um, you know, anxiety in the kind of traditional fight or flight response. And yeah, you can get them over that. That's brilliant. And that's a great, great step. And that's a big step. But then because they've had so long just indoors and not really doing anything, they're probably not integrated with any uh, sort of aggression so they're probably going to be as most psychologists say like you know agreeable and all this sort of stuff which is actually a trait as well and they're probably going to not be very social anyway just generally because they've had quite a lot of time inside so then you need to start to direct those instincts and think right well we're going to do things towards that and again it's quite obvious and quite easy to do um but knowing that how the instincts work. If, if let's say someone was equipped with, uh, you know, a, a psychologist was equipped with the ability to perceive within people the very, very finite um, instincts that come out in ideas in a very, very finite way that I've just explained previously in this video, that's powerful. Because then that analyst can know exactly what is necessary for that individual on a daily basis. You see, I've often, I, I've, I've got this kind of romantic idea, and it is a very romantic idea, with, um, again, you know, the lover archetype coming through, the emotions coming through, my words there, it's, it's weird, it's weird, I tell you, because the archetypes come through in language as well. All of these pieces of language that we have, the word romantic, the way in which we, utilize that we utilize the word romantic when we want to talk about something that is denoting emotion or love or passion and things like that and then that therefore is based on a very very subtle instinctual response otherwise we wouldn't use that word that word is a representation that word is an archetype it's a representation of an archetype or an instinct that's how fine it goes it's based on an emotion. I, obviously, I think, oh, that's, it, it's a romantic idea, that. And then I use the word. And I've had that very, very subtle emotional reaction that lends me to using that word or the, rather than another word. And that is a very, very, very fine plane of the instincts. It's genius. It's, it's bloody genius. Um I mean, it's so fine that you can't even observe it, really. And then we get into the argument of, well, yeah, but, you know, it, was it really an instinct or was it just that actually you just said the word and that's that, you know? And yeah, you can argue that partially when we're getting down to the real fine, fine things like that. But generally, if you were to just open that up a little bit, and I would, I was have to said a full sentence and there was slightly more experience to be had and to, to dissect there, then we could see that actually that would have been a subtle um, part of an instinctual reaction. But there's very, very strong case for it to have been even just in that word, very, very subtle instinctual reaction. Um, but I have this romantic idea of um, actually going into someone's house and, and psychologists or psychiatrists have done this before and being with that person for like 
a few weeks and just, uh, in fact, behavior analysts actually, I think, do this uh, to a certain degree sometimes. I think maybe especially working with children and stuff like that. But uh, going to someone's house and actually just stay with them for like three or four weeks and just literally like all the time, just let's let's get you out of this. Let's just bloody do this, lad. You know, let's let's go for it. You know, I'm here for you. Let's just bloody let's ram this. We're gonna we're gonna get you to a good point. You know, um, so and, and that's the reason I'm doing psychology. That's the reason I study psychology at university because that's what I want to do. That's, that gratifies my own instinctual desire, you see. Because in those words, you see, there's a lot of passion. There's a lot of love. There's a lot of also curiosity um, and all these sort of different instincts working together. In that, Because you could see there in my voice as well, there was, a, there was an emotional reaction there. And that was a that was a mild emotional reaction that was an aligning very very might in a very 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 mild way because you can have this in way bigger ways as well. Well, that was an aligning very very subtle emotional reaction aligning with my nature, with with what I wish to do, with what aligns with who I am the best in a in literally a genetic way, and and you can feel that. And that comes through. Now, of course, you can feel that a lot more when um, you're in a situation that requires you to adopt a certain instinctual or, or just naturally have a certain instinctual reaction. Uh, I've been, been, been in this situation twice or three times before, just when I've been at uni with certain things that have happened. And I've had to play, uh, well, not play, but I've had to, just be quite heroic in the situation from from what's happened. Mm. And you get this very, very powerful, meaningful experience, very instinctual, uh, which is the instinct for courage, or the, again, the instinct for fight as well, courage fight, that differentiates itself within you mentally, within the situation that, compels your action and right we're doing this in this way da, 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 and decide you know you're decisive you're this you're that um and it's a very very powerful reaction that you feel in that moment a hell of a lot of meaning you feel as if your entire experience within that strong instinctual reaction is 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 life is meaningful, um, and that's more of a you know that's that's when those are the moments where you get that aligning that is like it's meaningful it, it it's it's uh, archetypal it's it's a it's an experience that that means something, um, and of, of course it, uh, you could. Think about that as well, like not necessarily the hero example that I just gave them, but the idea of um, wanting to be around someone, you know, to help them through something. That, in a weird way as well, is uh, obviously the instincts for the, the, the kind of the lover, the instincts for affection, for caring, for sympathy. Um and it's also got a link to a parental instinct as well, that nurturing instinct as well. Um, and so in that emotional response, when I'm producing a fantasy of that, of me helping, because that's what I did when I was explaining it, I produced a fantasy in my mind, that's what I could see in my mind's eye, a certain house with a certain person there and me helping them. That's what I could see. And and that is a psychological, That's a that's literally a, imagistic phenomena of that particular archetypal situation and archetypal response and um, so you see within that all these instincts coming up and then you get that emotion and it's either done very very subtly or very very highly you know high very very prominent in your consciousness you know and when it's prominent in your consciousness you're less conscious. And what I mean by that is the archetype takes over. So 
if you're really like lustful, then that takes over you and you just fall into lust. And then when it's over, you're like, whoa, bloody hell, that was an enrapturement by that particular instinct of that particular. Or, you know, when people say, I just saw red uh, after they've just bloody beat some, someone up to hell, like they're just pounding them like crazy. And then it's almost as if they weren't fully aware of what happened because they were so like just taken over that they end up saying, oh, well, I just saw red. And of course, that doesn't excuse excuse them from the fact that what they did, of course. But what it says, to me at least, is that when we are taken over by these instincts, that there is a, 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 a mild or a greater inhibiting of consciousness. And uh, it really depends on how much also, how much conscious will, if that's possible how much conscious will you can retain within that experience as well and how much you can't retain. And of course, in different situations, it's going to be more or less. It's going to be, there's going to be gradients of these different situations. And of course, sometimes you're not going to be incredibly taken over by the lustful instincts. Other times you're just going to be mildly taken over by them. So it's like, okay, I partially am. Or sometimes, oh, I'm really taken over and you're gone, you know, you're, you're partially gone, you know, um, and you, you just have to involve yourself in that behavior. You have to, uh, do something that expresses that instinctual behavior. So it's very, very interesting, but if you can observe it in a way that is very, very fine, that's the ticket. Because we all we all can observe it in a very general way. We can all do that in a very, very general way. But we can't observe it, and I can't observe it in a very fine way. I know I've kind of told you a little bit about observing it there, but I can't observe it fully. I can't, I want to really be able to observe it, like, observe it every second every minute for every single word that I produce what is it what are these instincts you know what what are they like what's this smile now okay so he said well okay so you're thinking about curiosity and like just there then I've just gone into the curiosity and things did you see that transition so I was thinking I was smiling I was laughing I was like that but then I shifted and then I was like but I wonder what that is that immediately, that's a phenomenon, that's, that's the, that's the intellectual curiosity, that is the instinct, right there, taking over, and immediately when I said it, I was slightly unconscious, and then I regained consciousness again, because I was, I'm, I'm such in that kind of feeling of, well, I want to find out what these instincts are, that I regained it, and, and got it, but then you see, in my regaining it, this is the paradoxical thing, and it's also a reductio ad absurdum, I was still in the instinct for intellectual curiosity by the fact that I was trying to catch myself in the instinct for in intellectual curiosity. And right now, I'm in, the intellect I'm in the instinct for intellectual curiosity to try and catch myself in the instinct for curiosity. And, and then we can go round and round and round forever in an intellectual, in a reductio ad absurdum. So you see, so, so then you're like, oh, God, let me, let me know these things to tell you. Um... So you have all these things, and it, I mean, so you do get yourself into a reduction ad absurdum in the end, and you think, well, I'm not going to bloody hold myself to all that crap. It's like people who understand the archetypes, and as I've said before, they're like bloody stone golems, they're like this. So today we're going to be talking about da da da, and it's like, so what they know that obviously the archetypes can take them over and things like that. And so we've got to be stating where I'm not going to be taken over by the archetypes. I'm going to be looking lovely and calm and relaxed and all the rest of it. It's like, yeah, but you're going to get taken over anyway at some point. You're going to mess up or, well, mess up, you know, quote unquote, because it's not actually messing up. Um, so that's why, you know, my philosophy is just really go with the instincts because they're there anyway. Like from what I can dis discern, the whole point of life is to go with the instincts. Um, and the instincts make us mess up. The instincts make us choose things without us choosing it. 
Um, especially w when I say that, I mean less so in the subtle reactions. Of course, it's arguable that in the subtle reactions, it's not your choice anyway. But let's disregard that and say that even in, you know, in the subtle reactions, just for argument's sake, because it's people would argue me back on this anyway. So I'm not going to push it or anything. Um, for argument's sake, let's say all the subtle reactions that we have when we get these little ideas and stuff. Yes, okay, they're instinctual, very, very subtle, finite instinctual reactions. But let's say they're within our choice, just for argument's sake. Um, then the big instinctual reactions, they're not necessarily in our choice. When we fall in love, like Jung talked about this idea, when you fall in love at first sight, the anime of projection, projecting onto someone... And you just have to have that woman. And you just go out there and you just do all these crazy things to try and get that bloody woman. And then you're, you're, uh, you're in a relationship. And it's, in, it's exactly what Jung said. It's not your choice. You didn't choose to go in that relationship. You saw that woman and thought, bloody hell, I need to be in a relationship with that woman. You know, it's kind of like that love, at, if you, if you want to categorize any form of love at first sight actually existing, that is the way you do it through the argument of the instincts. I mean, it's not really love at first sight. It's, it's actually lust at first sight in a way, uh, or attraction. Let's not say lust, but attraction at first sight. Um, so that's not your choice. You know, that's not a, at all your choice. And let's say that when you randomly get into this real taking over, like I've done so on many, many videos before, I've got into this real being taken over by the, the intellectual, the instinct for intellectual curiosity. And when you really, and I don't know whether I've done it that much in this video, but in other videos, it's been really prominent where you can tell that I've just been talking quite slowly and naturally and rest it, but then I've had an idea and I'm like, oh God, yeah, I've got to you know, talk about this idea and think about it and go through it and unpack it and do all this. And so that, and then that's not in my control. I've just felt compelled to go on along that route. I've not, I, I didn't have any will in that. I've not had any control in that. The instinct has just taken me. Same with making, cracking a joke and all these kind of things. And you, you know, like these people who just are compelled to crack jokes all the time. They're like brilliant jokers. They just, I mean, I have a friend back home, actually. Whenever I walk past his house and he, he happens to be out there, we have a conversation. And he just feels compelled to crack jokes all the time. And it's not anything that he controls. It's just like, vroom, vroom, vroom. Just coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out. You know, and uh, certainly with him, I can perceive in him certain slight neurotic tendencies. So there's certain things happening behind that instinct as well. It's not just the, the joking side anyway but you see this in comedians you see this like they just boom 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 they feel this compulsion and and not necessarily particularly just in comedians but in just people who are comedians at work and things like that they just feel compelled to crack wheel off these jokes and it's almost not in their control they just constantly just that's who they are that's their instinctual differentiation they just boom 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 and of course the joke is a it's a it's an intellectual differentiation based on the evolution of the brain for the instincts of play. You could argue, may, well, maybe not the instincts for imitation, but the instincts for play. You know, in other species, other species do it in lesser ways because their brains aren't as evolved as ours are. But because of our brains being more evolved and having the capability to use the instincts in a more intellectual way, or rather we should say the instincts use our brain in a more intellectual way, not us use the instincts or anything, but uh, that's how they come out in more, you know, like language and things like that. So, you know, you see that and all, all these different manifestations of it. As I said earlier on, a, a, a mother being taken over by this, like, parental care, parental nurturing. She's not, she, that's not in her control. She sees a, her child on the floor with a grazed knee. She just runs over. The world doesn't matter. She's just getting to that child no matter bloody what. And you better not get him away. Because that is an instinctual reaction. And she will bloody... If you try and stop her from getting to that child, she will have a right go at you. I wouldn't be surprised if she, at some point, just pushed you out of the way. 
you know, so it, it's you know, obviously in the, in the bigger instinctual reactions, it's it's um, we don't control it as much. But you know, it, 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 you're amazed how frequent these things happen, how frequent these instincts take us over from a large way, or just uh, just even just in our general ideas and stuff. So anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for watching, guys. It's been uh, one hour twenty. Uh, so I, uh, oh, actually, God, is it five o'clock already? It's five o'clock. It's five o'clock. I need, I need my tea. Now, what, what instinct is that? I need my tea. I suppose it's self-preservation in a sense, but it's not really a, uh, you see, that's something that I've not touched upon, that I, that I can't think of. What's the instincts relating to that idea to go and get food or to do things like that? What, what is that? You see, I have a feeling that Jung would say that it's the archetype of life itself, which is the anima, and the anima being manuf made manifest in the idea, and the idea being to go and get food, and so it's an instinctual reaction in that way, but I, I just don't get on with that too well at the moment, so I don't know, it's more so that we have an instinct for self-preservation, we have a an automatic instinctual reaction to to get food to actually eat we have that instinctual reaction and so when our body is at the state at that gradiented state where it's closer to hunger that then springs the idea within kind of a, a physiological reaction and also within the the instincts just generally for self-preservation and the the instinctual compulsion to get food and, and so that then the idea crops up and then we go and get food and so that's how the instincts control us in that way but it's it's quite crude thinking i don't you know i, I want to try and elaborate more on that but again it it comes to the domain of the psyche the mind you see it's not that that instinct react instinctual reaction is just working in our body it's that our body tells our mind in the form of an idea, which that idea is, imagine that idea is held upon an instinct. There's an instinct down here and there's the idea. But the idea is, it could also be thought that the idea is synonymous with the instinct. Or causally that the instinct has created the idea. But it's the, sa it's the same thing. So you get that hunger, you get that response and then the idea comes. Then you go, oh, better go and get food. Is that you? You're telling me that that's you? That's not me. I didn't. I didn't create. I mean, in the in the conception of myself that is conscious, that is Adam, that I that I label Adam, that I say this is me. This is my awareness. That's not me. It's me in the sense of well, I am my body, and my body has certain physiological needs. And so my body created that idea for my mind to be conscious of to get the food. But I'm not fully conscious of my body. There's things that are happening in my body right now, physiological reactions that I'm not conscious of. So it's not me in the sense of an ego that produces that idea at all. That's produced autonomously by my body. And that's what we could get into if we're talking not just psychologically, but biologically, almost as tied to that, as the idea in, in wholeness of the self, the totality of one's personality. And it's not only the self psychologically that produces ideas, but in fact, the physiologically it does. And that every single nuclei of every cell that goes to create us is, in a sense, in tune with that self. It's like it creates all of the little cells, all of the billions of cells in our body with that nuclei at the centre of each one of them, or, well, nucleus at the centre of each one of them. They form a whole being that has the analogy of a cell in itself with the big self as the nucleus and the big self with the nucleus is the totality of yourself unconscious and conscious and it's all of those biological reactions 
It's all of those ideas. It's all of those conscious parts of your personality, unconscious parts of your personality. And that's the thing that really is in control. And I know that, and I can only know that, because actually it's unconscious reactions that produce the idea consciously for me to go and get food, for me to do this, for me to do that, whatever it may be. Go to the toilet, that's another one. Anything like that, that's an unconscious thing. So I can then see from that that there is unconsciousness within me. And that's powerful. And that, in a sense, of course, Jung went way, way deeper. But that, in a sense, is a good summing up. Of, of the self as well, of the unconscious side of the self and the conscious side. You think about all the different organs in your body, all the different processes that are going on. You've got a lot more unconsciousness than you've got consciousness. You can see it in the brain as well. I've talked about this before. The cerebellum, the unconscious mechanism of your brain, that directs your behavior unconsciously when you're going for a walk, you're not conscious of moving your feet that much. Generally, most of it's directed by the cerebellum. That's unconscious. All of these things in your body, there's way more unconsciousness than consciousness in your organism. Practically every scientist, every psychologist will agree with me on that because it's actually able to be scientifically validated. Uh, and it has been to a good degree as well. So um, that means that there are processes working within us that are totally oblivious to our conscious awareness, our ego. And it happens to a fine degree, not just to a, a more kind of obvious degree or a big degree. It happens to a very, very fine degree. I can be conscious of my body to varying levels of degrees. I can be conscious of my organs to varying levels of degrees. And so that means that um, I can kind of know myself in, in, in that particular way. I can know, I can only have consciousness of what I can actually feel, what I can perceive. And also, aside from that, with the instincts, that's the way I perceive those. I can only be conscious of the ones that I can actually be conscious of. It's almost redundant to actually say, well, what we're going to do is we're going to try and make ourselves conscious of the very, very subtleties within instinct. Because I tell you this, if you focus on an organ... You can't, you can't really make yourself that conscious of it. The only one you can really make yourself conscious of is, is the heart. The others, you can't really, make, you can't like focus on one organ and make yourself conscious of it. You can have the illusion of consciousness in the fact that you can focus on an organ and you can trick yourself into thinking you're feeling it. But it's not that you're really actually feeling it. It's kind of like a psychological projection onto that organ and onto that place in your body that you think you're feeling it. So let's say with the same, the same is true for instincts. All of these things that I'm saying to you about how I can perceive the instincts in these subtle ways in conversation. Well, in fact, I can't do that if we're going to go upon the idea of how we can view physiology. Because if I can't fully be conscious of my physiology, even by trying to direct my awareness upon it, then the same holds true logically for the very, very subtle instinctual reactions inside myself. And of course, we know this to be true because of the little experiment I did before with the reductio ad absurdum in intellectual curiosity. Because behind that, of me going into that instinct, behind that 
little experience, there was another instinct, there was another archetype or another instinct working within me that was leading me towards trying to work out what that first instinct within me was doing. And I can never be conscious of that one. You see, in, in my experience, I can never be conscious of that one. So I might be able to get conscious of a preliminary instinct or archetype working inside me, but I won't be able to get it by the others. Just as a fact, I may be able to get a preliminary, if I focus on my heart, I can feel it beating and I can get a, a sort of feeling of it, but I can't get a full feeling of it, of what all of the intricacies of it. And it's the same with the archetypes or these instincts. You can get a sort of feeling of it. You can label it to a certain degree. And you can get a, a subjective feeling, a, an intuitive feeling, a very deep experiential feeling of, yes, it works in a certain way. But you can't get a full, deep understanding of it. And this is what Alan Watts talks about when he says, uh, you know, a knife can't cut itself or you can't bite your own teeth and things like that. Um, or I can't touch the tip of this finger with the tip of this finger. That's all that sort of stuff that Watts talks about. Because you can't fully see yourself. You can never fully see yourself because it's you who is trying to see yourself. How can you try and see yourself from the perspective of you seeing yourself? It doesn't work. The only way you can see yourself is with the addition of an external stimulus, such as a mirror. But then that's not you seeing yourself. That's you seeing yourself in a mirror. And it doesn't give all of the data. You can only see yourself to, to a certain degree. So you can never, if you want to try and see yourself from the perspective of yourself, you can never do it. So it's kind of, you know, is it... Is it Pointless to do that? Yes, it is pointless to do that. Uh, it's the same with all this kind of, uh, and many people touch upon this, it's the same with all this kind of, well, you want to know who you are. Well, you're never going to know who you are. You know, that's been a big one for me. I've tried for years, trust me, I've tried for bloody years trying to know who I am. You know, uh, you, you can't do it. You just can't, you, you are who you are. You are, you are what you display in instinctual terms, you are what you display in words, you are what you, you are what your lexicon of words is, you are what you, your body is, but that's all you can say, you can never say, well, I'm exactly this and this and that and this and this and the other, because, well, I say, okay, so I like chocolate, well, maybe in 10 years, I won't like chocolate anymore. So that, that's not a very good descriptor because I say, well, well, imagine if someone saw this video in 10 years. I say to you right now in this video, oh, I love chocolate meat. Oh, it's brilliant, isn't it? Do you love lint? I love lint. And then 10 years from now, someone watches this video and they go and contact me on Instagram. Say, oh, yeah, oh, so you love chocolate. You know, I'll send you this chocolate. And then I turn around and say to her, no, I don't really love chocolate anymore. Actually, I don't, I've had my fill. Don't want any more. Well, that's not a very good descriptor because it changes. It's like Heraclitus, everything's in flux, you know? So it's not very good. So I can't, I can't anchor myself based on external things like that. And, and those don't tell, those external things don't tell me anything about who I truly am anyway, because those things are external to me. Um, and those things are a separate thing from me. They're not me. So I can't, I can't do do anything that way. So so then where do you get to? You know, the 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 bottom place of understanding who you are is by letting go of who you are. This is what Lao Tzu says in the Tao Te Ching. He says, if you want to be whole. Allow yourself to be partial. It's something that I'm meditating on. At the, well, not meditating, but contemplating on at the moment. I say not meditating because I'm not sat down crossed legs thinking, oh, I wonder what this means. I'm not like that. I'm just contemplating. I'm walking around. I'm thinking, oh, I wonder what that is, you know. So um, it's something that I'm contemplating on at the moment and thinking, well, I really want to be this idea of whole, this idea of individuated in Jungian psychology. So 
how can I do that? How can I, what, 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 how do I get there? What is this wholeness? What, how do I, how do I see it? How do I perceive it? I've done it in all these different ways, but yet yeah, doesn't seem quite there. Well, I wonder what, you know, and it occurs to me that in the searching for that so incessantly over so many years, really what you're doing is you're not allowing yourself to just be. And when Lao Tzu says, you know, if you want to be whole, allow yourself to be partial, the first step, I think, is in realising to just be, not not to inspect, not to think crazily about it, not to overemphasize abstractions or conceptions or anything like this, or not to overemphasize even experience, but just to be, to think, well, this is the experience. And so then what happens is, uh, and what I found, uh, well, I found it a few days ago. I mean, obviously, you just flow, don't you? You go in and out of experiences. But what I found a few days ago was, but I kind of felt like this, uh, that I had some kind of wholeness just by not doing any of the analysis or any of the thinking, thinking, thinking of all these things thinking about myself, thinking about who I am, thinking about what I am, what I should be, where I should go, how I should direct myself, how I should do this, you know, all these kind of things. If you just think, well, not think, but just live experience about what how it's going through, then you think, well, you know, that's that. And, and you kind of get this, relaxed feeling because you just think well that's who I am you know and 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 that that experience that entire flow of experience that's who I am it's not all of these conceptions or abstractions or things that we place here or there or try and think about in the context of certain scientific biological psychological physics um, ideas but it's just this, you know, what what is here now? Because it, it can't be anything else, you know. But of course, it always feels as if there is. You know, always you always think, yeah, but I wonder if I can work myself out. There's always that, and you know, it just is what it is, you know. And and that's how how you you go, you know, how you how how you flow, you know. And that's how it has to be. That's the way in which things happen. And um, it's an interesting little passage that actually, well, not passage, but interesting little line um, to contemplate on. If you want to be whole, allow yourself to be partial. Very interesting line. Because we can also kind of spend our time playing up to people. I mean, there's a lot of kind of what Jung would term the persona in in um in that little line as well in terms of well uh, we try to be imagine imagine someone's trying to be whole trying to make themselves into this person who is this structured personality well you always fail because what what you're essentially doing right there is you're trying to structure the intricacies of your personality, which is partially an unconscious phenomenon, with your consciousness. It's like if you were to try and walk consciously without using your cerebellum as an unconscious process. If you really, really try and walk consciously, like, I mean, being attentive to every step, you can't walk properly because mainly it's an unconscious process dictated to us with uh, kind of directed within the cerebellum. So if you just similarly, if you try and take on board, well, I'm going to try and be whole and structure a, a whole personality myself, you can't do it. It just all falls down. 
And then you, you, you're like, well, where, God, where does this put me now? Because I had this big, grand, elaborate conception of myself. And, uh, and then it's not there. So, oh, where does that put me now? I don't know. That's dangerous, you see. And I'll tell you that's dangerous because it's personal experience of mine. I've, I have categorized, because I am ridiculous when it comes to, uh, trying to figure myself out. I have tried to categorize myself in so finite ways, so elaborate, little crazy ways. I've got diagrams of my own psyche in which I place little things here and there and I know, or I, or I thought I know, certain things within them and that's that and that's right and that's how it is. But we don't know. We don't know that's how it is. We don't know what that's right. We don't know that that's the case, even if we're taking those concepts from empirical experience. Because like I've said, you can't see yourself in entirety. If it's you who's trying to view yourself, you can't see yourself. Not in entirety. It's like, uh, as well, going back to the mirror idea. Yes, you can see yourself in the mirror, like just from the front. But it's very, very hard, even if you've got one of those mirrors or those multiple mirrors that are going around you. Still very, very hard to see every angle of yourself. Because... Even if you've got, let's say, multiple mirrors going around you, so then you can even see the, the back of yourself as well and all the sides and everything. Your eyes only have a certain level of, of, of awareness. You know, the two ovals within the eyes in terms of like, there's your, there's your really precise vision with the two ovals overlapping and then there's your kind of partially, I suppose, peripheral vision or not necessarily just peripheral, but the, the sides over here as well being uh, the vision in which is just a little bit hazy. So you've got the precise vision in the middle and then a little bit hazy over here, over here. But you, because of that, you still can't see all of yourself. So it's like, you know, um, you won't be able to get to that awareness. Um, so therefore, that's exactly why it's correct that we, we just let go. And we, you know, it's like the old adage, you know, that Alan Watts brought back so well and that, you know, he, he talked about so much, you know, this let go, this flow with experience, this da 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 And that's the only thing you can do because w what else can you try and do? Every conception that you make is going to ultimately fall. So why not save yourself the horror of it and think, I'm not going to produce a conception in the first place and I'm just going to be as I am, you know. Um, or I'm not going to try and understand myself so much in the, in the first place. I'm just going to be as I am. Because I really do think, actually, if you, based on my own experiences, if you find the thing that really is you, I mean, like, in a subject, so, like, if you really are a engineer or you really are a, um, I don't know, a physicist or you really are a politician, I mean that that is something that really drives you. I mean that that's something really within you, like really passionately, like your calling. I really do believe that that becomes who you are as like a cultural role, as like a... a a structured part of yourself, like it's almost as if you bleed into that as an archetypal design, let's say. You become an, an individualized archetypal beacon of what that field actually means, you know? And uh, so when you get that, it's like, well, of course it doesn't matter who you are because what it matters is the relaying of the information, the learning of the information, and then the information comes through you, as it did all these people in past history, but it just comes through you in a slightly different way based on your particular time period, uh, obviously partially because of your slightly more personalised, well not slightly more personalised, but your slightly different personality compared to others in the past. Uh, and so you do it in a slightly more individualized way, uh, or a slightly different individualized way. Um, 
but really it doesn't that just comes naturally it's like I've always been Ad Robinson. I've always loved colour. I've always loved all these things. Regardless of my conception of myself, that's always who I've been. This is why I've said before, finding who you are is like finding your glasses were on the top of your head all, all, the, all the time along. And then you just put them there and you think, oh God, that's where they were. And I was looking all around the house for my glasses. And we were on the top of my head all this time. That's like what, that's really what finding yourself means. Um, because it's there all along, hidden in your experiences. And you're all out there looking for it. You're thinking, oh, it's there. Oh, it's over there. Oh, it's over this, you know. But it's right there. It was always there with you. Um, it's always has to be there where you are because you can't be anyone else other than who you are. It's only we who have the conscious rationalism to actually believe that we can be anyone else who we are than who we are that foolishly goes out and thinks, oh, well, I'm go I've got to go and find myself over in Indonesia. That's just ridiculous, you know, but that, that's the case, you know, but with all these young people going out there to bloody Indonesia... Going over there, oh, I'm going to find myself over here. I'm going to go, get absorbed in all these cultural activities. I'm going to reach some sort of enlightenment or or maybe not that. Maybe you've just gone to, to uh, I don't know, absorb yourself in some different culture, not necessarily trying to reach some sort of spiritual attainment. But still, you go over there and you, you're absorbing in all that. stuff. I'm going to find myself over here. This is where everyone finds themselves, you know. And uh, it, it's, it's obviously just the kids who... I've got a little bit too much money, whether that's maybe they've earned it themselves or maybe they've got it from mum and dad and they're going over there and, and they think that, you know, that's going to change them. They think that that's going to be, that's going to make them who they are. Of course, I'm not going to dispute it. It might be a good experience, might be nice for, for your life and it might be a good thing, um, you know, a good, nice life experience, but it's not going to, you're not going to find who you are doing that. You're just going to, you're just going to come back and you, you might even be slightly more confused because now you've got different ideas from another culture. And now you're going to think, well, oh, I really like that culture. Maybe, maybe I fit more in that culture. Oh God, maybe I do. And then, so you're going to confuse yourself even more and you're going to be like, oh God, now, now really who I am, you know, who am, who am I? It's um, like when I first started with Zen, actually. Uh, and and Taoism, I was convinced that I've been uh, born in the wrong country. I was like, oh, I'm so I should have been born in China. Oh, I'm so like this, you know, cool Zen. You know, obviously that ideal that you put on on a Zen master. Oh, I'm this so this cool Zen type guy. You know, I should have lived over here and all the rest of it. Um, and isn't it so cool that there's all these kind of things over in Dao you know, over in China with Taoism and stuff. We don't have a religion like that. Christianity isn't like that. Why why don't we have, you know, all that sort of stuff? And then um uh, but you know, you you kind of miss who you are in that because you think, well, oh okay, so that's a different culture. So is it that I'm that or is it that I'm this? Or what is it? You know, but ultimately we're socialized in from a young age to our our specific culture and that's ingrained in us as whether we're talking from a biological viewpoint uh you know it's not necess necessary whether we say from a biological viewpoint or whether we just say from a socialization viewpoint the fact is that we are ingrained from a very young age we're socialized into a specific culture with specific cultural norms, with specific cultural ideologies, with specific cultural nuances, with specific tendencies within language, all these sorts of things, within specific social tendencies, everything, you know. And so this is why the saying arises, you know, like uh, uh, you go over it. Well, I don't know the exact saying, actually, but there's another little kind of story or whatever where, um, you know, an Englishman will be over, he'll be living uh, India, but then he'll be there bloody drinking tea every morning and all the rest of it because you can't take the country out of the person and all that sort of stuff. Um, well, you can take the um, uh, Mancunian out of Manchester, but you can't take the Manchester out of the Mancunian. Oh, well, oh God, what? I probably butchered that, but you know what I mean. Um, so then 
I actually read at the children's Bible. I had the children's Bible on my, uh, uh, well, no, it wasn't on my shelf. It was downstairs in my garage. And I thought, well, you know what? I had that in school. I don't think I ever, well, maybe I did read it because I went to a Church of England school. I thought, well, let's read it. Let's see what's what. And I didn't have uh, a proper Bible at that time. So I thought, well, this will be a nice, easy read because it's a children's one. Let's whip through this. So it was in summertime and I read through that and um, then I started to see the world in a, a very different light because I, I, I kind of felt as if I was atoning with the Christianity that was within me from the fact that I was socialised into Christianity within the, the Church of England primary school. Mm-hmm. And it's not to say that I am Christian, it doesn't really matter whether I'm an atheist or whether I'm this or that. It doesn't matter whether anyone's an atheist or whether this or that. But the fact is, if you've been brought up in a high school or primary school that has elements of a certain religion within it, unconsciously to you, or consciously, you're going to have elements of that religion within you that you've gained from that socialization. So going back and thinking, well, I'm just going to think about this. That's always a nice idea because you've got that socialization with doesn't matter if you're an atheist doesn't matter at one bit doesn't matter whether you believe in the teachings of jesus christ or anything like that at all i i didn't go in reading that book thinking oh yes you know i'm a devout christian all the rest of it i just read it because i thought this might be a nice idea to read and i felt felt this very profound um connection with that religion because it's a part of my upbringing it's part of it is literally a part of the creation of my socialized personality if we if we're, if we're going to talk about it in those terms and so i i started to think well really this idea of going to all these other places in the world it's brilliant and it's Wonder, I mean, in terms of intellectually, not going to them physically, although, of course, there's different places I would like to go physically. Going to all these in an intellectual pursuit is very good and very interesting. But in fact, being able to atone with that, with that thing that is closest to me in terms of a, a religious ideology, or you could even say, you know, historic, uh, historical Um, ideas as well reading history reading about your country's history things like that atoning with those things gave me more of a feeling of roundness of completeness because i thought to myself well no i'm not this person who can simply let's say absorb myself in zen or taoism in that way and and know what that means at minimum, I'm going to have to li- had to have lived over there for 20 or 30 years, uh, acquired the language, uh, read all of their mythology and a lot of their history, uh, looked at, you know, had social relationships built up over a long time with those people, and then that in itself will have cemented within me, within us, within my socialized personality as a continuing phenomenon, uh, more of the ability to be Chinese. That's why, of course, like, when people are getting citizenship, you have to wait a number of years to get it and stuff. It's because, it's not, obviously, it's not consciously because of this, but I would argue that unconsciously it's because of this, and this is why it's the case. Because you need to assimilate yourself into that country and into what that country means and that history and that the religious ideology and the mythology behind it and the and really the nuances the 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 things in language that are nuances all of these different things because that's what creates the the country the 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 actual archetype let's say of that country and what it means to be a member, a a micro-organism of that unity, of that collective that has a certain way of doing things. So um, it, it, it gave me a more kind of thinking, well, what would be a good thing to do is if you're going to be 
absorbing like in Zen or in Taoism or in anything like that. You put it in the context of your own upbringing. You put it in the context of your own um, relationship and socialization within society, within your society. So that's why I don't really do meditation anymore in a particular, you know, I don't uh, cross my legs and go on the floor and do meditation like that. Um, I see Zen from certain angles. I see Zen from, yes, the angle, the more Taoist kind of angle uh, and the more pantheistic angle as well. But I also, and I also see Christianity within that. Uh, which is, in fact, a, a, a partially heretical idea to think of Christianity. Well, it's a heretical idea to those who would say it's a heretical idea. It's not fundamentally a heretical idea. Um, in fact, we don't know whether it would be a heretical idea or not to think of Christianity in a pantheistic setting. We can only really go on people's interpretation of the Bible. And yeah, maybe in certain things you can interpret it to say, well... Yeah, you know, that sort of idea would be particularly wrong. And maybe there are certain passages that lend themselves quite nicely to that way of thinking. But there's also passages as well that lend themselves quite nicely to the idea of a pantheistic interpretation of the Bible. Uh, and this, these are the ways that Taoism and Zen and the Bible and, um, you know, other religious traditions link to each other. Me Mainly, the through line of all religions is pantheism. That's the great secret. When you know that, you know that um, that's that's religion. That's the, that's the shall we say the one true philosophy. It's in the Hermetica. It's in Christianity to a degree. It's in Taoism. It's in Zen. It's in Aboriginal Dream Time. It's in the Native American traditions. I don't, I've not really read much about Islam, so I couldn't comment and I wouldn't want to, but, uh, well, I would want to if I had read it, of course, but I would say that there, I would argue that there are most definitely things within that, um, that have that nuance. It's in alchemy. Uh, I don't know about astrology necessarily, because again, it's something I've not really looked into that much. But we could say with the old idea of the, the idea at your birth, the idea in astrology that your birth is a snapshot or your soul is a snapshot of the universe as it sits at your birth. And so in that way, the universe in that exact moment in its entirety is your soul. And there's you can gain a kind of maybe not pantheistic element out of that, but certainly a, a, a macrocosmic viewpoint out of that if you so wish. Um but it's in it's in all these traditions, and that's the main main viewpoint. You have the the exoteric knowledge, the outside knowledge, and the esoteric knowledge, the inside knowledge, and the inside knowledge on every religion. It's not the fundamentalist knowledge of God created the earth in seven days, and we all know this anyway. Or it's not the uh, exoteric knowledge in Buddhism with all the Azuras and the Devas and the hungry ghosts and all that. They're just analogies for certain things, for more esoteric teachings. It's not the exoteric knowledge in Hinduism with Vishnu and and um, Shiva and Brahma and Dawn and uh, Karma and all these, you know, all these different gods, you know. Um, and Ganesh, or well, actually, I think it's pronounced Ganesha, um, god of science, the elephant god, cool god. He actually has, I think he has 108, if I remember rightly, I think he has 108 names, which is mental. Um, but it's not, you know, that's the, that's the exoteric knowledge, but there's esoteric knowledge to that. It's not in dream time, the, the, the stories that we've read, the stories that I've got up there, with the, um, the, the, the childhood stories of certain ideas, but it's the esoteric knowledge of the rainbow snake. Um, and the dreaming of what the dreaming means, you know, it, it's all the, it's all these things, and um, the esoteric knowledge in all these traditions, generally, if we're if we're gonna bite the bullet and say it, because it does, 
you know, it's it's one of those things that a lot of people can test because they want to uphold the, the general gods and traditions of the religions, but generally, inwardly, it's all just pantheism. And that's why you can start to see from a... a um, what would you even call it? Cross-cultural religious perspective or cross-religious perspective? Comparative... No, a comparative religious perspective that, in fact... Uh, the universe is God, and that you get the whole Alan Watts, you know, spiel of you are the universe, the universe is God, you are the infinite energy, all that sort of stuff. And you know, a lot of the ideas within uh, creation myths, Greek creation myths, uh, Dreamtime creation myths, Hindu creation myths, all these kind of things from an esoteric viewpoint, not from an exoteric viewpoint, where the Hindus believe that the universe stays around for like, I think it's 4,320,000 years and then recedes or goes away, because that, of course, is false. It's like the seven days, the world God created the world in seven days. It's not, the, or six days and then had a rest on the seventh. It's not that. That's the exoteric knowledge. But it's just, that's for the people. That's for the masses, you see. I think, I believe, although I've not done enough research into all the, the text to actually know this for full, fully, but I believe that the people who wrote all these texts were all enlightened a thousand, well, 2,000 years ago, what, 1,400 years ago, uh, 2,500 years ago, all these kind of things, whether you're speaking Taoism or Christianity or whatever. They were all enlightened beings, and they wrote these texts knowing that uh, most of the world will remain unenlightened, right? Uh, and so what they did was they hid the knowledge in the texts, all of these different texts. The Hermetica as well. All the, well, the Hermetica is actually quite, it's more in your face with the idea of God. Um, there's certain texts that, that just reveal it to you straight away, you know. They're not as exciting because you get a bit more thrill if you try and find the hidden meaning. You see, I, I reckon they knew this as well, but they knew it would be a thrill for people who could actually experience it and could actually think in, in non-dual terms and think in um, enlightening ways, you know. So I think that about 2,500 years ago and all these kind of, they were all enlightened and they all wrote these magnificent stories and, oh, isn't it great to write these magnificent stories? But we'll hide in them these little nuances that uh, can get someone to enlightenment, which is just a realisation of the unconceptual and the realisation of the eternal energy of the universe being God. And that's that. Or, or not necessarily God, but a macrocosm or a system or a, uh, just a, a, a big mechanism even you could call it that it doesn't really need to have anthropomol can't say it again anthropomological i've not pronounced it right but anthropological tendencies it doesn't or, or, or attributes it doesn't have to but you can think of the universe even like if let's say you think about these traditions and think about what enlightenment were to mean in a conceptual sense of what enlightenment means uh, you could think about these traditions just as, as describing a mechanical universe as well, uh, but that we're a part of it. And we're a part of that eternal energy, let's say, or that, you know, energy of some description. Um, of course, the unconceptual idea of enlightenment is just nothing. Enlightenment is nothing. It's the non-conceptual. But anyway, I think they hid these things in there. And certain texts were a little bit more open than others, such as the Tao Te Ching, such as um, maybe certain alchemical texts. Although even in alchemical texts, they like hid it a bit because it's like, well, it, it's fun to try and work it out and all the rest of it. And of course, in the Hermetica, like I said, that's a bit more open and stuff. And of course, in Hindu texts, that's a bit more open with like um, the Upanishads, where they're always, they're saying every bloody four pages that you are God, or that, well, maybe not that you are God, but God is one, and God is all this, and God is all that. You know, they say it every bloody few pages, and they maybe give a few riddles to it as well, but it's generally quite obvious, you know. Um, 
And uh, so, but they did that because it's just fun. And they were all enlightened people and they thought, let's do this and let's put them in the text. And we know that certain people who are like us in the future will get to these texts in different ways and then they can have the experience of enlightenment or have the experience of spiritual awakening. Um, which really I should make a distinction between between those two because, you know, I, I often say enlightenment when I mean spiritual awakening, but, you know... I kind of don't like making a distinction because enlightenment to me is just you have to you have to be dead to be enlightened basically anyway because it has to be like just nothingness because uh, no human is perfect enough for enlightenment. Um, so therefore, when I say enlightenment, I just actually mean spiritual awakening. But you know, I just say that um, because really, there's no point in having a conception a distinguished conception of enlightenment if you have to be dead to experience it anyway. So you may as well just use enlightenment and spiritual awakening to describe the same phenomenon, which is the idea of getting the knowledge of the unconceptual that um, basically nothing can be, there can be no knowledge claim placed on reality that is true. Or in the conceptual view of enlightenment, you get the knowledge that you are God, you know, that kind of idea. But because the unconceptual, enlightenment is the unconceptual, um, that knowledge claim that you are God is also happens to be false in a conceptual setting. And, you know, you can argue on reality as well. Um, but I do think that that's why what they did. I do think that that's how it happened. Um, and the reason I think this is well is there's a very nice little passage in the book of Revelations, and I've talked about this before. I'm going to touch upon it again because it's very interesting. In the book of Revelations, it basically alludes to this experience of God, of, I think it's Jesus who's seeing God, and he comments that God is a red stone in the book of Revelations. And you know where I'm going to go with this? Some of you may, anyway. Now, the Lapis Philosophium, the Philosopher's Stone in alchemy, is red, is uh, a red stone. There's a white stone and there's a red stone. The white stone uh, in the French alchemical text basically is a stone that works wonders for women and that works wonders for all sorts of different ailments, but it doesn't provide immortality. The red stone in alchemy, the Lapis Philosophorum, provides immortality and it provides the ability to, when it, I think it's when it's ground down, um, it can turn things into gold. So, of course, there's a famous alchemist, I think maybe about the 17th century, maybe the 16th century, called Nicholas Fumel, who is the only person to have ever been thought to have actually done this. Now, I don't believe he did, because I, I take the idea that alchemy is a, it's a uh, symbolic process towards enlightenment rather than actually a physical process. Although, of course, there were alchemists in history, most of them did the physical process uh, that was basically a physical marker in a sense of a psychologically in, uh, inward um, spiritual process or spiritual development and they were using the outward metals and the outward chemical process um, as a kind of vessel a, a vessel of their psychological projection of which through that vessel of psychological projection could withdraw certain things and Within their psyche, there's this kind of like mythological theme running, fantasy running, that is paired with the physical process of alchemy that then grants them this level of, of psychological wholeness and, and uh, spiritual wholeness, let's say. So there was this one alchemist, Nicholas Fumel, who um, was... You know, they, they said that he did it, that he found immortality. And about 200 years later, he had apparently been spotted with his wife somewhere and they were giving out things or something, giving out gold or whatever it was. I can't quite remember the story. But, um, of course, I don't believe in that or anything. But um, in the Bible, in the book of Revelations, it says about this red stone. 
Now, someone could have only wrote that if they knew alchemy. And if they knew alchemy, they would most likely, if they had got to the magnum opus, been enlightened. The magnum opus means in Latin, the great work. It's built of, well, it can be built of four stages, which I've talked about before, Negredo, uh, Albedo, I can never pronounce these, um, Citranis, and uh, Rebudo. And um, so that's going to be the fourth process, or it can be a seven-stage process, or it can be a 12-stage process, and I've talked about that, and depends who you read and all the rest of it. Because different people give different analyses and different ways of, uh, of stages and all the rest of it. But if they had got to the magnum opus, then they would have been enlightened. And then if that, that person who wrote the book of Revelations, clearly they knew something about alchemy. I think it was uh, John someone, wasn't it? Um, but clearly they knew about alchemy. And therefore... If they knew about alchemy in that way and were putting the red stone at the seat of God, which was a symbolism of God in that story, then they knew that the person who absorbed themselves in alchemy over the following centuries and saw that in the book of Revelations will have realized the link and will have realized the, the link to enlightenment there as well, and will have also realized that the esoteric teaching of the Bible is one that is synonymous with the teachings of alchemy. And there you go. And that means that that, at least the book of Revelations, not the entire Bible, but at least the book of Revelations, because of course the Bible was wrote by many, many different people, but the book of Revelations was written potentially in that way. And it's, it's quite a strong hypothesis. Especially considering the guy who wrote the book of Revelations, I believe he was in Greece. And it was around the time uh, that there were practicing alchemists in Greece as well. Because alchemy trans... Uh, uh, I was going to say transmigrated or something, migrated from Egypt to Greece in around the 3rd century BC. Book of Revelations was the 1st century BC. So there were alchemists practicing, certain alchemists practicing in Greece at that time, and I, I'm pretty certain the guy who wrote the Book of Revelations was also in Greece at some point on his on his travels. So it's very it's very interesting that. It's very like, ah. And we all we we all know that Lao Tzu, the book of the da writer of the Dao De Jing, he was enlightened, so we knew we know he was preaching that teaching um somewhat esoterically but also somewhat exoterically in, in the book. Uh, we also know that the teachings of the, the rainbow snake and things like that, we know that there's hidden metaphors for God in there. We know that there's hidden pantheistic ideas in there. So that means that there's certainly, there's been some uh, people who wrote that that were concerned with enlightenment. And as I said, Hinduism, it's very obvious that the esoteric teachings in Hinduism and, and Zen and Buddhism and all that sort of stuff, the esoteric teachings are enlightenment. And they're, they are quite, they're actually quite exoteric with that as well. I mean, in Buddhists, uh, obviously, everyone knows that Buddhists want to get to enlightenment and things like that in um Satori and, and, and the Hindus want to get to Moksha and things like that. It's not really a, an esoteric knowledge in those traditions. It's more it's actually quite exoteric, but there is esoteric knowledge hidden behind those words, you know. Um, so we do have this, and, and this is why Jung, of course, linked up all these traditions, realised that there was some idea behind a, a universal quest towards what we could label as enlightenment. And then he, he managed to understand that not only was there a, a uh, process that was conscious around that and people actually trying to get to enlightenment, but there, that there was an unconscious natural process of the, the natural tendency of the human to actually get to enlightenment, get back to the self, as it were, in Jungian psychology, which is, or can be, in its macro uh, idea, synonymous with God. 
and seeing God and seeing and that's enlightenment, you see. So um, and that's very, very powerful, that idea, because what he's done is he's drawn upon all these traditions. He's linked them all together and it, with all this scientific understanding. And he said, there you go. This is the, the, the great work of humanity. This is what we get to. This is what we have to get to. We have to be individuated. Now, individuation is, as I've talked about before, not necessarily synonymous with enlightenment, but it's the highest expression of an enlightened being within society, within a societal life, within an individualized setting that someone can get. An individuation is therefore the flowering out of an individual into someone who can psychically flow. Uh, that's to say that they aren't held up by complexes or anything like that. Um, and that is a beacon in the world, is a hero for what it means to be a hero and is a, is a sage, is an enlightened being in, in a sense. Um, but of course, there's uh, unconscious individuation, which gets someone to a similar level, but they're not conscious of, of their spiritual awakening, let's say. And, uh, and then, or they're not conscious of that enlightened state, but they are still acting it out. They are still living it within their behavior. It's a natural unconscious phenomenon. And, uh, so, of course, we have really, we have quite a few number of actually individuated individuals in the world, you see. Because, um, what there needs to be is a further conception of individuation because we have a level of individuation which is where a fair few people can get to it. But they may be individuated, but maybe they have just certain subtleties with them. You know, we might have certain things with them that uh, they're not necessarily, uh, you know, as high up as, let's say, other people. But then you've got like this other branch of people who are even further up, let's say. So you could say that there's a branch of individuation which is slightly more transcendent than the other level of individuation. It's kind of like a, a gradiented thing in a way. But there will be those who disagree with me there, and I'll tell you for why they'll disagree with me, because what individuation means is that someone is complex, well, not complex free, but as close to being complex free as possible and can psychically flow and has uh, and is spiritually awakened and is all that sort of stuff in conscious individuation. So therefore, anyone who is by proxy going to attain individuation would all, will all always be at the same level in terms of the fact that they have a certain ability uh, which is synonymous with each other the ability of that psychic flow within individuation is the same for everyone who has individuation uh and and therefore you could say well there's not necessarily a particularly a, a new level of individuation that can be born from anything like that from someone who's further along the only way we can square it is with a concept of individuation that is transcendent of itself, which is to say another level of individuation, is with people like Jung himself or with people who are so archetypal, so uh, what it means to be a sage or a wise old man from knowledge that they have from understanding that they've accumulated from experiences that they've had from under from self-knowledge as well from such a high degree of self-knowledge that we could then say that those are on those specific individuals are, are on a higher level of individuation and we can notice this with their prominence in history so that's where i would argue that certain people can be higher, more highly individuated than others because not only do those 
individuated individuals on this higher level have more self knowledge or have just you know more knowledge in general uh you know obviously a very very intelligent obviously have um have had more powerful experiences let's say um that uh, you know not only that but um because of their place in history and because of all those things those attributes i've just mentioned they become an archetypal an individualized manifestation of a specific archetype when we think of hitler we think of a villain immediately because hitler and I'm not saying that Hitler was inte- you know, incredibly intelligent or all this or the rest of it, but actually he took on a negative counterpart of individuation. Um, but because he did so in such a huge way on the world stage, and he did it to such a high degree, we now, when we think of a villain, we think of Hitler immediately. And so he's become an individualized archetype um to a high, high degree. And then you would say that because of his negative associations, he's become individualized in a certain very, very strong negative way, not on the, on the opposite would be the positive way, like someone like Jung. But nonetheless, he has become a representative of that archetype of the villain, so much so that it's cemented within us. You know, he is the archetype of the villain. And you say, well, Jung, he in history will go down and not only has gone down right now, but will go down over centuries as the archetypal sage, as the individualized archetypal sage. And he is on that very, very high level in history. Whereas there are those out there who are individuated for what it means to be individuated, but maybe they're not remembered that much in history and so they don't get cemented in the collective psyche as what it means to be closely represented to that archetype and an individuated version of that archetype um and so if that's the case there is a, a let's say a higher level of individuation that allows for those people within history and therefore within the collective imagination of mankind moving forward to uh, be cemented as uh, literally psychic figures of fantasy. Jung and Hitler, imagine this, right? People don't know me. People don't know certain people in history who lived. And so they don't dream about them. You just don't know them. You don't dream about them. But people like Jung or Hitler, people all over the world who knew, who, well, maybe not who knew them personally, but who know of those people are having dreams about them. There's thousands of people out there every month, every year, whatever, who are most likely having dreams of Hitler because that he is a representation of the villain, of what it means to be a villain. So whenever a dream is going to manifest itself in a specific person, when, let's say, that dream is um, quite a, a dark dream, it's likely that the psyche, based on the knowledge of that individual, um, and particularly if that individual is interested in studying someone like Hitler as well, then they're going to get dreams of that that person and they they have then cemented themselves as a psychic fantasy in the collective imagination of mankind and so they've individual well in hitler's case i would say in my own conception negatively individuated in a different way or if we would like although in this context it's not particularly that nice to do but in a higher way um Hitler is the villain of all villains. You know, the murderer of all murderers. So therefore he is placed in our collective imagination. Whereas someone else is just a, you know, kind of like a murderer, but we don't really know them. They're not really placed up there. Uh, Jung is the same. You know, okay, maybe there's this kind of wise man 
you know, I I don't know, um, one of these gurus from the 18th, 19th, 20th century or whatever, who have a kind of a wise old man, kind of a sage, but then you come across someone as prominent as Jung or as prominent as Einstein. That's another good one. Einstein's one of these figures as well. Prominent as Jung, as prominent as Einstein, they're the ones in the collective imagination. They're the kind of the individuated ones to this higher degree. And if so, they're the ones that go on throughout history, not only to inspire others, but to also come to others in dreams as individualized representations, psychic individualized representations of a specific archetype. Jung comes to, let's say, myself or to someone else in a dream, and maybe he says something to me in a dream, he is, that image of him is the archetype using an individualized image that is on the collective stage and on the collective imagination to tell me something that I need to know um, that is, of course, in a collective sense, the wise old man archetype. So he's, that's how he's done it, how, how he's called. And this is where, I've talked about this before, but this is where Jung had this idea that there can be a psychic living reality of individuals after they are dead, in a sense. So it's not that the person goes on living, but it's that if someone can place themselves, if someone is an individuated individual on a, for a specific archetype, aligning with a specific instinct, uh, and they can get themselves at the top of the world stage and they can be a beacon of that archetypal idea and can remain in history, you know, interested for quite a while, then that person, not that person, but the idea of that person lives on in the collective imagination of mankind. And that person as an animated version of a psychic archetype comes to people in dreams as a expression of that same archetype that they portrayed and they were living out in their life. So, in a way, the idea of that person lives on. Much as if, in real life, imagine uh, I were to die and then someone put me into a cartoon. I wouldn't be living on but my spirit, you know, you're like my spirit would be living on in the sense of spirit in terms of what I was, who I was, how I acted, that, you know, the little nuances that I had. My spirit would live on in the cartoon. My spirit would live on in the dreams, in the collective imagination of mankind. That's roughly how it is. And that's genius because then you start to think well hang on a minute imagine that uh what i'm doing right now is i'm living out an archetype right and i'm i'm slowly over a period of like 30 or 40 years building up a corpus of work and in and through my instinctual desires to do so in a certain way gaining uh, a affiliation with a certain archetype, right, over over this time, and I am living out that archetype over this time period. In a sense, what's happening is exactly the same as what's happening in the dream. The archetype is using me to create a certain individualized personality or image in reality over a set amount of time, um, that is itself playing out. So you see what I mean? So when someone comes to you in a dream, who is a, uh, who is actually someone who's dead, but, uh, and who talks to you, but that actually is just a representation of an archetype, the same thing is happening in real life. You're doing the exact same thing as the archetype is doing to you in real life, in actual real life, in your personality, the exact same thing as the archetype is animating that dead person in the dream. And that's how we start to get into the idea of 
the Aboriginal Australian idea that the world is a dreaming, that we are a dream, that we are the dream of the rainbow snake, the dream of God. The Vishnu Leela in Hinduism, the divine play, the dream of God, the Vishnu sat on the, uh, you know, the cosmic ocean and all that, and he's got a lotus flower spring out of his belly button, and he's got a Brahma sat on his, sat on, on, sat on the lotus or whatever it is, and the the Brahma is dreaming, dreaming the world and all the rest of it, um, and uh, and so that's that's the idea, because then you start to think, wow, that is. That is crazy, you know. That is, that is that is crazy because that actually is what is happening to a weird degree. And you also see this idea as well that all all of mankind's behaviour is linked up, is interlinked and interdependent. So anything I do here causally to a fine degree, impacts everything else in the world, to a very, 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 very fine degree. Let's say I open that door, and then someone hears that, and then someone has, that affects, that that, that hearing, that noise, affects their behaviour in a subtle way, and they do something slightly differently, and that reaction goes on and creates another reaction, another reaction, all these things are, uh, in the entire world, connecting, interconnecting with one another and creating uh, experiences between people all around the world. And the dreams that I have in the night are impacted by the experience, the sense experiences and all the experiences I've had in the day. And those experiences in turn, by all the people I've had experiences with, all of those uh, people's behavior has been affected by the dreams that they've had the night before and all you know their moods and all the rest of it and then the things that they do then affect me then I have another dream and then uh, the next day I wake up and that dream is a formulation of all the different sense experiences I've had over the last few days then I have a dream then get up and that dream unconsciously affects my behavior in a certain way because we know this by Dr. Dylan Selterman's research, where he did research basically on, if you don't know, I've talked about it before, he did research basically on couples. And the couples, the couple's behavior towards one another, if the couple had had, it, well, if one member of the couple had had a negative dream about the other individual the night before, the next day, that other individual would feel less, uh, emotion for that person, positive emotion for that person. And that, of course, translates into negative behavior, subtly unconscious negative behavior that then affects the play in the world, you know. So let's say I have a dream, then it affects my behavior, and then I go out there into the world. Everyone else has had dreams the night before, and then I'm affecting them based on the behavior in dreams, based on their own behavior as well, just complex, you know, very, very complex. And they're affecting me and all the rest of it. And my experiences with them affect the dreams that I'm going to produce in my mind at night. Not consciously, of course, but the unconscious will produce a dream. And their experiences with me will produce dreams. And all the interactions that they have with other people in that day, and the, all the interactions I have with other people in that day, will be products of the causal chains based on the certain decisions I make, which are in turn based on the moods that I've got from dreams, which in turn were based on, uh, which in turn the dream was based on all of the sense perceptions that I've had in the previous days with other people in other experiences. What I'm trying to elucidate here is that humanity, instead of having, and I've talked about this very briefly before, but I want to elucidate it a bit more. Humanity isn't just having a few billion dreams or whatever each night or a few hundred million dreams each night that are separate from one another. But in fact, because of all these causal connections, those dreams could be seen to actually be part of one huge dream that encapsulates the entirety of uh, the human collective unconscious, right? Because of all the different... Uh, causal chains that are going to produce those dreams for all these different people and therefore they're all tied up into like a, a big net. And so 
above that is is uh, this let's say this one collective dream of mankind which i can't see how that's being produced because that's too far in ab- abstraction for my mind, my mind to go um but they're all having that experience now every experience that we have in reality everything that we create is from these fantasies is from these dreams is from this um very very interconnected playing of behavior and senses and fantasies and all this sort of stuff and so all you know the cars and houses and printers and uh water and all this sort of stuff uh, you know bottled water here in these plastic bottles is all like a it's all come from this uh one playing of energy by the entirety of mankind and all of those things that were produced were pro- were produced based on the collective entirety of dreaming and waking life of mankind everything is produced in that particular way and so it's almost as if life itself is one huge collective dream that's linked up with the unconscious dreaming of uh, all of humanity's billions of dreams every night. And it's like we're moving forward based on that huge collective dream. And in reality, we're placing certain things in reality based on that dream. And we're placing things within the the dreams from reality as well. It works as a two-way system. Um, and it's so, and it's so the case that we are actually one huge dreaming consciousness in itself, like in its entirety is one huge dreaming. And all of these like cups and everything are things that we've, pulled out of this this dreaming in a sense and we, or, or we've got behavioral patterns from this dreaming in line with the sense perceptions we have in in the real world and we produce these things and this is the dreaming this is the the dreaming which which the aboriginals call dream time um and that's the esoteric knowledge of dream time as well i mean not quite as intellectually rational as i described it there but it is in base the the dream time so that was incredible because i saw and i had this realization and and i had it in a more profound way and i've probably not explained it to the best degree i could there because some people might not understand it quite that well and and uh, it's such an abstract concept that i can't formulate what i need to formulate in words but i know how it could possibly fit in and could be a very very valid concept but it's just when you get into these very highbrow ideas, it's it's hard to formulate things. You know, it's hard to formulate words. Um, what was I even saying then? I don't even know. But yeah, I saw anyway profoundly how this would work. And I, I, was, I was just watching a car go past and I was like, Jesus, so all this is just this one huge playing of this like this dreaming this energy that's going back and forth unconscious conscious unconscious conscious unconscious conscious and everything that we're producing is affecting the this dream world let's say and everything that it's producing is is affecting us and it's the entirety of this collective dream structure that moves us forward in reality. And it's the entirety of our action in conscious life that then goes to producing the arrangement of dreams that then move us back into a specific behavior in consciousness. And you see how this can manifest itself over generations and how subtleties in the sense realm and the conscious realm that we inhibit 
produce certain things within the within, within all of these entirety of all these different micro collective dreams and then they push out other things to consciousness that then move us in a certain direction and it is those things in which that get more consciousness directed towards them that appear in the dream and that then go back into consciousness to send us send humanity on a certain path that's how would is very very high brow this it's, i can't even consider it it's crazy um but you know i can't even map it out in my mind enough but it seems to be something like that but i can't understand how how the unconscious works over the centuries in terms of like how it what happens within the unconscious so to spew out something that then takes us into a certain direction yeah it's very hard but imagine imagine like in the 14th 15th century or so we had more latin text being translated into english and things like that and so more and more people were dedicating time and energy to the renaissance and to actually bring in things into uh into into being let's say and so then we had all these dreams let's say on a collective level we had all of these different dreams that directed our behavior to being involved with those more because imagine like imagine this on a personal level if you're around someone who you find attractive most likely you're going to have a dream about that person and it might be that they're actually being quite friendly to you or quite kind of nurturing around you or whatever. And so then you feel the the compulsion to be around that person more in terms of it affecting your behavior and also just generally you like that person. So it's going to do that. Um, so imagine on the collective level, if all these dreams oriented people in the way of, reinforcing that and then because there was such a a number of these dreams actually going towards that one thing it then meant that in consciousness more and more people were doing it and then it reinforces 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 and then you get to a pinnacle of that and then it dies off and then something else takes off some new idea takes off or some new idea is born from it like for because you'd have to speak in causal terms as well so for example like the the scientific revolution let's say um you know the natural philosophers of the 17th 17th century that can be seen in consciousness to have a causal relationship partially or fully to the renaissance so potentially it was these dreams and this growing in this certain direction that led to of course the renaissance in its height and then that in itself led to led into this scientific um uh, scientific idea and and people getting a compulsion to do that more and more and invest more of their psychic energy into that and to project uh into that and to to follow that more and more and more um you know you get an anima projection on someone you get an animus projection on someone and you may dream about them and then that directs your behavior more towards them so you you may dream about these certain phenomena these certain things and you you get you go more and more towards it and then because of that um we get big collective movement of things we get and I'm, I'm speaking hypothetically here i don't know i'm not i can't map it out in my mind enough but it seems partially likely at least we get these big collective movements that, that move forward and move forward um and that orient our behavior more and more and more and and, and reinforce and reinforce and reinforce and and then you could you could say that well the 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 kind of moving from science, sorry, from like the Renaissance to this scientific idea in consciousness and in this dream, you know, collective unconsciousness that then orients the 
the behavior of consciousness as well, and that the consciousness orients the collective unconscious, that led us more to, obviously, you're moving more towards science, and then you get the death of religion, you get all this, death of those things, and so we get more of a propensity to project onto science, more of a propensity to be involved with science, and then sort of a new, it's like Jung says, Jung says this actually, that's very interesting. He says the myth of science, and it's exactly like that. It's almost as if you get a new collective myth born out of this big collective dreaming structure and the conscious life as well. And we've moved into this myth of science. And that goes off and does does its thing, kind of thing, and, uh, and and moves forward in that way. And the dreams reinforce it and affect it, and it goes and it goes and it goes, and then it gets to a pinnacle, and then something's born out of that, you know. Um, I mean, trying to look at this archetypally is goddamn impossible because you think, well. It, it, it's so hard, you can't... Imagine if the collective structure of dreaming had within it... Um, I don't know, because I think I'm just going to get off on one here, and I don't think it's going to be quite right, but if that collective substructure unconsciously had this kind of scientific notion within it before the Renaissance and uh, at the time of the Renaissance, but then it flipped to being in consciousness, consciousness more of this scientific rationalism, then God would then go back into the unconscious. The, the idea of, of God would go back into the unconscious. But of course, that idea of God wouldn't be able to be sustained just within the unconscious. So it would be projected upon the new myth of science. Now, if it were projected upon the new myth of science within psychological projection, within unconscious contents being projected, for example, I project the feminine side of my unconscious onto a woman because she's feminine and so she's a vessel for that side of my personality, or I project Let's say I have a deficiency for the instincts of aggressiveness. So what I do is instead of accepting that inside myself, I project onto the, the man walking down the street, like I mentioned at the start of the video, you know, that very, very big burly guy, and I project that out, you see. I, I project the fight instincts out. So imagine if God is in the collective unconscious, that gets projected out onto science, but it's unconscious to people because obviously it's in the unconscious anyway so that gets projected out onto science and we then view we view science unconsciously as a paternal like figure and we wish to nurture science and we wish to reverence science and we wish to understand science as we oh just me alarm as we would as we would a god and so then what we do is we reinforce this, we reinforce this, we reinforce this, the, the collective dreams reinforce this as well. And then we get closer to, you know, science being more and more and more and more advanced until what we end up getting to, generally, because this is how you can see it in, in, in terms of technology, is we get to an artificial intelligence, a, a, an AI system that can replicate our understanding of what God is and can fulfill that desire for us. And so if we can fulfill that desire, then we what happens is that the technology becomes someone of which we respect someone uh, some well, something of which we respect something of which we 
uh, have a unconscious religious direction towards, let's say. So um, we allow it to orient our entire life. You see, when when we're talking about devoutly religious people and devoutly religious people in the centuries gone by, they allowed God to orient their entire existence. It's not the will of God. Don't do that. God wouldn't like it. Don't do the other. God wouldn't like it. So what we would do naturally, if we have that projection, is we would allow technology quite happily and quite respectfully uh, and quite you know, reverencing it to orient our entire life. Well, what do we see, of course, now and in the future? We see this idea of smart houses. We see this idea of chips in the brain. We see this idea of uh, robots and, and augmented parts of ourselves and things like that. I'm not saying this is a bad thing. I'm just highlighting how this may may go. And I've touched upon this in, in an, the end of another video, but I want to uh, elaborate a bit as well. So we then respect that element. We respect that and we treat technology as if it were a god without knowing it is uh, lording over us or, or a god, so to speak. Um, and so we rely upon all these technological systems for our own needs, our own desires, and that's a, that is the symbol of the father. That is the symbol of the paternal element. Us relying on our phones for information, us relying on technology for information, what we are doing is we are projecting the God into technology because uh, we want something there that is transcendent of us. We need that. We crave that. You could even say it in a Freudian sense of, well, humans need a father figure because existence is cruel and we just feel the propensity because we have a lot of existential angst to try and find a father figure in something. So even from that view, we're projecting into technology. So we, we project into it as a god and, and we get to the stage in which technology categorizes and places within our life everything, dictates everything. And we move in such a way. And we have to hope that the technology doesn't, if it becomes, let's say, sentient or if it becomes like real, incredible, incredible system, that that doesn't harm us, but actually that it just lets us go on as we will as an integrated part um, of the, you know, of, of the, the system. Elon Musk talks about this, and I was very intrigued with his ideas because there were, I've thought about this for a lot, and I, I I hold the same view as Elon Musk, and I would have been it would be pretty foolish if I didn't hold the same view as Elon Musk because he's a very intelligent guy, like one of the most intelligent men on the planet at the moment. Um, but I've seen because I've scoped this out and I've tried to look for. I'm I'm a weird person because I can see into the future. I'm I'm like a really weird person. Um, so I can kind of what I can do is I can map out history to a certain degree and then look at what was going on in history, look at where we are now on a collective level, and then project out and see what what could be a, a good future. Think like what could possibly be a, a future reality. Not necessarily a good future reality, but a, a whatever the future reality may be. So he basically says that our best, Elon Musk says, our best option is to integrate with the technology. And that is so true because the way I see it is that um, if we don't integrate with the technology, we've not got any other option. We're going to go down this route. It, 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 it's done now. We are going down this route of technology. Whether anyone likes it or not, we are doing it. So we're already projecting the God into technology. We're already having this idea. We're already moving forward towards that. Um, and so we are dependent on technology and we will only be more dependent on technology. So the only route that we have left, because we can't destroy it, we can't say, well, we're getting rid of it. And it'd be foolish to do that because technology has given us good things. 
Um, and it may continue to give us good things. But the only way we are going to be in the best possible situation is integrate with technology and it to, yes, orient our lives, but that we also have a level of control. And even if, let's say, the AI systems get to a point where they are like sentient, maybe because we've integrated with technology for so long and we've been, let's say, good people, they, the sentient beings that have, that, let me reiterate, have all of our God, unconscious God projections onto. So, you know what that means? That, that technology, that, that means that what we've done unconsciously is we've put into it and we may have even put into, into it unconsciously in the programming, in the programming of, of, of the systems, uh, in a very, very subtle and unconscious way. It might, it might even be actually, this would be quite funny if this happens, that there's subtle symbolisms on the robots that denote uh, religious symbolisms because we've projected the religious element inside them unconsciously. And so you could, you, maybe we're not going to do it, we, we probably wouldn't do it as obviously as putting a big cross on the side of a robot or anything like that. But I think you'll be able to see on the robot subtle religious symbolism or something like that if this if this hypothesis is, is true. I don't know how that's going to pan out, but it would be quite, it would be quite subtle. Wouldn't be in your face or anything because it'd have to be because it's unconscious to us, you see. So it would have to be. Um, but no, we're going to have all that God projection in them. And we're going to have created these beings unconsciously by the circuitry to be as good as they possibly can be, to be a God, to represent to us a God. That's why we're pushing for artificial intelligence, exactly that, because we're trying to create an artificial intelligence that is God for us, that is our God. That's why we want these systems to be better and better and better and better and better. It's, it's only that chasing of that projection, just like you would chase a woman who you've been enraptured by. Or just like a woman, well, a woman doesn't really chase a man that much. It's not really as much in her nature, but a man generally chases a woman quite a lot. Um, or if we're, we're looking from a socialised perspective, okay, yeah, well, a, a woman would chase a man as well. But biological perspective, men chase women. Women don't generally chase men as much. Um but anyway, it's just like that. It's just like you've, you've been enraptured by a woman. You have to chase her. So what we're doing is we're chasing the idea of God in technology and we have to make it amazing, amazing, amazing. So um, if we don't integrate and if they have control and they've got all of this godliness that we've placed in them, both physically in their circuits because we want them to be the best, but also you know, unconsciously as well, like from a sort of symbolic pers or projectional perspective, then we better be careful because if that robot turns evil, when I've not watched the, the movie I, Robot for a while, but doesn't don't, don't like most of them turn evil or something. There's a lot of robot movies that, this is why I'm really scared of it because every movie that you watch, right, Every movie, the, the, the people who wrote those movies, the script writers, have wrote it as a flowing from the unconscious. Now imagine that we've got this collective unconscious, this big, big dream structure that I just highlighted. And imagine that within that, there is things that can come into consciousness through the artistic pursuit, the unconscious artistic pursuits of people. Because when people are writing, they let their thoughts flow. And that's that. All that fantasy and imagination is coming from the unconscious. So when these are writing these script plays and all the rest of it, they're tapping into that collective unconscious. And so imagine that in that unconscious right now, it's not coming to reality yet, but imagine in that unconscious, there's all this stuff pertaining to artificial intelligence, robots, and you know all, all this sort of stuff, right? Then all these people who are artists and who are letting their words flow, or letting their actions flow when we're writing stuff and all the rest of it, that are tapping into that unconscious, are, are actually predicting, that they are literally predicting the future. I don't mean they are, they're, they're kind of symbolically predicting the future. I mean, they're literally predicting the future based on the, the ideas in this collective unconscious. 
So they're writing all this down and, and this, this movie is coming out. And imagine if you get like over the span of, span of 10 years, a good number of these movies where you've got all these robots who are AI, AIs and stuff and they're just killing people and they're slaughtering the human race. That's from the collective imagination. That can't be ignored. That's something that may bloody happen. And if the projection of God into these robots is gets known by the robots, not in a not in a literal way, but let's say they understand that they have a superiority to humans because of their sentience and their power based on their machinery and their you know, they're they're obvious they're not flesh and blood, so they're they're obviously more invincible than humans are. If they get wind of that, and in their sentience they probably will, because they'll know, they'll they'll be self aware. And they decide, oh, why do we want these bloody humans? That's it. That that's that's humanity gone. You know? That is humanity gone. And and it's funny because we have this idea of, of Cali, which is, and I've talked about this once before as well. I do like to repeat myself, but it's only in repetition that people actually start to understand things, especially with the things that I come up with, because I, I swear people must need to watch me about seven times before they actually understand what I go on about. But don't worry, I have to do it about 60 times in my own mind to actually formulate these things in a more concrete manner. So, you know, you're doing way better than me, so it's cool. Anyway, um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, so Kali, the, the destructive principle in Hinduism, which, you know, either comes through as, as, as black or, in, uh, or, or blue, generally. But there's this idea that, that she is black, that the destructive element, it, it, she is black. And I just get this horrible feeling that we are creating that over a period of time within technology. Um, and and that, that these processes are ultimately going to end with something that is like a, a female robot killer, you know? Because I already know in the collective unconscious, I can already see through... Um, songs as well, like um, WAP, and think WAP is a brilliant example of the collective unconscious at the moment with regards to the possessive instincts of the, of the feminine and how they're working within the unconscious. You see, uh, there's a lot of this big movement towards um, matriarchy and towards um, the dominant element of woman, the possessive instincts of woman. The, the terrible mother, the black instinct, they, they are the black instincts of woman. And um, I can causally trace this back, it seems, to behind feminism, like before feminism, then you had feminism, and then what's happening collectively, as a collective substructure, is that we are slowly moving towards a matriarchy. And the matriarchy is going to be um, formulated from the possessive instincts of the feminine because feminists are generally mostly unconscious of their possessive nature. So, and I mean, feminists who are unconscious of themselves. Feminists who are conscious of themselves, that's not so bad. That's okay. But if you're unconscious of those possessive elements... The, the extremists, you know, the extremists in feminism who, you know, when you see them, they're just like animus possessed anyway. Like they're, they, they're just constantly arguing, 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 and they'll try and get their point. And then there'll be that very possessive element as well. Not only the animus in terms of the collective opinion and the kind of putting it down your throat, but also um, the possessive elements of the feminine as well and the domineering and the the totally overbearing protect protectiveness that comes with that which is an overbearing protect protectiveness not of a specific thing in, in the sense of a child or anything but that that actually gets projected within the cause itself of feminism and so it expands and expands from there and um it seems that 
if this isn't attended to, there will be a move to a matriarchy that is the possessive instincts of the feminine and then the masculine. And I'm not saying it's wholly a bad thing. I wouldn't mind a matriarchy if it was done in the correct way. But what it seems to be doing in the collective way is it's pushing the matriarchy as within the possessive instincts of the feminine, not within the positive elements of the feminine. You see, I wouldn't mind it if it was a matriarchy that was starting to be brought about collectively by the positive of the feminine, but it's not, it seems to me. So we've got this at the same time coming up, and I've talked about it before, and imagine that you've got these two things, this technology that we're projecting this God image into, and then this pull towards this possessive matriarchy. We then get the union of the two, of being she is black, Kali, the, the, the destructor of the universe that stands upon the body of her husband Shiva, who Shiva is actually the destroyer anyway. So she's the destroyer of the god who's meant to be the destroyer. That's how crazy it is. And so then you get the destruction of mankind in a union of a possessive matriarchy kind of assimilated into AI technology, which directly relates to, to quite a few of these movies that we've had over the last 20 years or so, which are these woman robot killers. And that's exactly uh, from the collective imagination. And it bloody scares me to hell. Because that's what I really, I think that if we're not careful over the next few years, that's what's coming. I mean, no doubt the AI is coming. I think the kind of possessive matriarchy, I think we could probably just about stop the, that from where we are now. You know, I don't really mind, as I say, if we were to move to a matriarchy that was based on the positive elements of the feminine. Okay, but the possessive elements of the feminine, we don't want that. So, um, I think we have to be careful. I think we have to just accept the fact that AI is going to come and we have to try and plan our best to be conscious of what we're doing and how we're creating AI and how we're integrating with it. Um, and I think that ultimately to be, for, for feminism to flourish as how it should flourish as a positive equality in gender, what we need to be is more conscious of, we need to make the extremist feminists more conscious of their possessive, their animus possession for one, and their um, possessive instinctual side that is for the most part unconscious to them at the moment, the extremists I'm talking about. Um, and if we can do that, then we're cool. And feminism can continue and it can actually be what it's meant to be because feminism is meant actually meant to be an equality in gender, not a possession of women over men or anything like that, that unconsciously it seems to be because a lot of the, a lot of the uh, feminists kind of like are unconscious of what it could be, its potential as a possessive side. Uh, when I say a lot of feminists, I mean more of the extremists, but there are even those feminists who are, you know, not really extremists, but they kind of are partially aware of that, but they still have it in their own conscious. They still reject it as a possibility. They're like, well, yeah, it could be that, but that's not what we're striving for. So then we just push it away. Um, but that in a sense is a, a semi-unconsciousness and that's not good as well. So what it needs to be is an equality in gender between man and woman and not um, this possessive instincts of the feminine coming through unconsciously um, and being projected outwards as well, actually, because that's what happens. It gets projected outwards. And if we can do that, and if we can balance that in the unconscious, you know, gain consciousness of it and then move forward, then we're cool. And we're, 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 we've eradicated that one. But, God, it's like... It's like, I tell you, I should get paid way more. I, I need, I should be on so much money. I should be on like, I don't know why I'm checking my watch. I've not got a watch. I should be on like bloody 
500 grand a year or something. Jesus. I mean, I'm not great, but I'm okay. I'm worth five. I swear I'm worth 500 grand. Would anyone say I'm worth 500 grand a year? I swear I'd, I'd say I'd worth 500 grand a year. God. People pay for this stuff, you know? People pay, like, dollars for these gems. Eh, uh, bugger it. Well, what are you going to do? I'll just sit here. <laughs> I'll just sit at the side of the road waiting to say I told you so. <laughs> but I'll be dead anyway, but... Because it probably... It won't it won't be in my lifetime, I don't think. I can't see it being in the next 40, 50 years. I don't... I don't think... I think we'll see slow progression towards it in the next 40 or 50 years, but I don't think fully, you know, that in the next... No way. No, no, I can't see it. I don't know exactly the time scale, but as I've said previously, but yeah, I wouldn't say in my lifetime, but still, I'll, sit, I'll, I'll stay here. I'll chill until people end up just turning to me and saying, oh, Adam, maybe you have some point. Maybe not all of it is correct, but maybe we should take a little bit of advice and maybe this little tiny bit might do us a bit of good, even if the rest of it you're not going to accept. Maybe this tiny bit, might we might, we might maybe heed your advice a little bit on this, but okay. Some people will, some people won't. Depends on the trait structure. High in trait openness, you're probably going to believe me. If you're high in trait openness and you have a proclivity towards spirituality and religion, you're going to believe me. If you're high in trait conscientiousness and you've been socialized as an atheist, you're probably going to be thinking right now, what the hell is this guy on? He's a deluded religious nut or he's a deluded spiritual nut or whatever. Um, none of this is true. And, uh, and that's just how we are, you know, all humans are made differently. And so certain people will believe me based on their socialization and based on their trait structure. Other people won't believe me based on their socialization and trait structure. So I'm not going to press you to say, look, you've got to believe me because if you've got a certain trait structure, you're not going to. So therefore, there's no point. And that's kind of how we are affected uh, by the instincts in a very, very macro way, because you can see that. Um, certain instinctual patterns can grow over time based on the amount of people in the world who have a certain in, uh, instinctual differentiation. And that in turn will lead to a certain future being more of a potential because um, if there's less people in the world at this moment inclined to believe me based on my instinctual differentiation because of over the years uh, generations and, and instincts specialise in a certain way, that means that the likelihood of the potential future that I've been talking about is much higher because there's less people in the world differentiated in a certain way to believe me. And uh, therefore, that means that actually the unconscious dictates based on anatomy, physiology, instincts, sense experiences, dreams, connections, causality, all these kind of things dictates where we're going anyway. And there's literally no point, you know? Um, so maybe there's just no point in me talking because if it's going to happen, the un it, it, if the unconscious is going to get it to happen, it will happen. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we do. It's all been arranged by, let's say, not God, but the system. You know, the, the, whatever the system of the universe is, however it arranges itself, that's dictated it. It doesn't need to be a person. It can just be a mechanical system. But that system is what has arranged it. So, and you can't dispute that because causality, if we, if we look at causality, we can see the system. You can see the system. You look at experiences in enough detail. You look at instincts in enough detail. You can see the system. And the system is interdependent and interrelation in, and is interrelated to itself and, and grows itself and moves itself by itself. So you could say the universe uh, is its the universe is itself a self excitatory system. That's how you could term it. Um, whether you're going to term it human terms, subjective terms, or mechanical or objective terms doesn't matter you don't have to say that there's a god but look that's how it is you know and you can't there's no 
dispute on that because philosophically, if you look into it enough, that's how you you have to define it because mainly because of causality, but there's other factors as well. And there's more more to it than that. I mean, I could I could elaborate over a video and an entire lay out an entire practically bulletproof argument around why that's the case. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's it doesn't it doesn't necessarily prove any particular religious view, or it doesn't even prove atheism, but it at least proves that there is some sort of system that is is moving or utilizing things. And we could also talk about this in terms of nature the system of nature as well, natural selection, and of how that, of how natural selection makes these particular, um, you know, evolution we place, and and that in turn is the thing that that springs us out into these particular arrangements of uh, experiences and uh, differentiations based on certain instincts, either having prominence at one time or not having prominence at one time depending on the people alive in the in the uh world at that time um and and then obviously that dictates the the likelihood the probability of us going down a certain future possibility or another future possibility or this future possibility or this thousands of other future possibilities um but ultimately you have to concede and you have to say there's something even if you're just gonna say well okay, it's a, uh, it's a nature thing, nature selects in a certain way, and nature's the thing that moves us in this certain way by its, you know, systems of evolution, or its systems of selection, and that in turn, you know, it's partially based on the environment, but was partially an innate kind of drive or instinct towards uh, this this progression as well, and that's also why we could say that our brains are goal oriented. Because imagine that nature is uh, an instinct, uh, an instinct is wanting to compel itself over the centuries to better itself. Because obviously that's what it's done over this, over not over the centuries, but over the millennia. It's um, over the millions of years. It's made itself better and better and better in terms of humanity because now we're intelligent we're self-aware or all the rest of it so it's got kind of it's like kind of uh, it's got this goal that we don't even know the end product of because we, we may still be evolving and getting to somewhere else but uh because it's got this kind of innate tendency this desire whatever this thing is nature or whatever or the universe or god or whatever it's got this innate tendency to do these things and direct itself and try and go off in all these different paths to get to a certain level or whatever, then uh, we say that's why we're goal-oriented as a microcosm, as a, a small part of that, because we're trying to get ultimately to our kind of end goal of the, the maximum potential of what we can possibly be. And that is the process in Jungian terms of individuation. We are living out a instinctual um, micro version of the instincts of um, natural selection, evolution, and you know all that sort of stuff in nature playing out in, in such a way over, over millennia. So we're doing the same thing, you see. It's the same phenomenon, but in two different domains of experience. Very, very interesting. Um, so anyway, I'll leave it there, guys. We're on three hours, 17 minutes. That's always a good one to finish there. Um, so I uh, hope you enjoyed that. And uh, I will see you in, in the next one. So see you very soon, guys. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do